Region State of Iowa for September 23rd, 2020 will come to order. I'll begin by calling the roll. Regent Dunkel. Here. Regent Barker. Here. Regent Least. Here. Regent County. Here. Regent Dokovich. Here. Regent Bates. <laughs> Here. Regent Lindemeyer. Here. Regent Butker. Here. Regent Richards is present. We have a quorum and the meeting can proceed. At this time, I'd like to turn the meeting over to uh, Regent Dunkel, who will run the audit and compliance committee meeting. Thank you, President Richards. I'd like to open the audit and compliance committee uh, meeting by um, referring you all to the board book that we have. And item number one is the minutes of June 4th, 2020 of the Audit and Compliance Committee. Did anyone have any questions or corrections to the minutes? Hearing none, then the committee will approve the minutes by general consent. Next, I'd like to welcome and introduce Deputy Auditor of State, Marlis Gaston to present the FY 2020 state audit plan. Thank you, Regent Dunkel. Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see you all. It's nice to see people, frankly. <laughs> I've been working from home for so long and it's just nice to, nice to be in a meeting with some folks. So um, this presentation will be typical of previous years. Um, if you wanna go to the next slide for me kind of shows you what I'm gonna briefly cover with you. Um, I usually go over what the, what professional standards are coming up, just partly as a reminder, because we've talked about a few of them in the past, but also um, to give you an idea of what's coming a little further down the road. Gasby's issued 97 statements now. So, um, so we have a lot of work ahead of us in the coming years. Um, then I'll also uh, walk through what our audit scope for fiscal 20 looks like, um, what our approach will be, our um, anticipated timeline um, and staffing. Staffing, just a few small changes in staffing this year, otherwise it looks pretty typical. Um, and then uh, what we anticipate the fiscal 20 financial part of the audit um, will cost. Um, and then the last bullet is really related to the next agenda item, which is, um, the previous year's audit reports and what we issued. So, okay, slide three. Slides three and four both kind of just give you a at a glance look at by fiscal year what GASB standards we have um, coming up um, to implement. Uh, of note on slide three, GASB 95, this one was issued just shortly after I believe I met with the board last April. Um, and in light of COVID-19 and um, many of financial folks resources as well as auditors um, have been sort of refocused to uh, some COVID-19 and pandemic issues. So uh, GASB took um, note of that and uh, delayed the effective date of several standards. So, um, so that's, a good thing. Uh, it, it postponed by one year, most of them coming up, and then it postponed GASB 87, which is the, the big lease one, by 18 months. So, um, so we'll be working through those um, over the coming years. So if you go to slide, uh, the next slide is, is um, the other leases or the other statements that will come due or be effective in 22 and 23. So they go out to 97, as I mentioned. So next slide, just briefly um, walk through some of these. GASB Statement 84, we've talked about in the past. Um, GASB 95 actually pushed the implementation back of the standard to fiscal 21, um, but the state of Iowa had progressed pretty far in being ready to implement this standard before um, GASB postponed it. So the state of Iowa is early implementing um, the, the uh, fiduciary activities standard during fiscal 20. And because of that, the universities um, have to follow because they're included in the state's um, CAFR. So 
um, in order to give a clean opinion on the CAFR, all parties included in it have to follow the same standards. So this standard, um, I think most of the universities are well on their way to being ready to, to put this one in place. It just, it changes some terminology of, of our agency funds to custodial um, and gives us some additional reporting requirements for those. So not the hardest standard we've ever had to implement, but certainly it's taken some time for the universities to, to get organized for it. The next slide, GASB Statement 90. This one, a um, little less impact. It's not effective till 21. Um, we've probably mentioned this one in the past as well. Um, it really has to do with um, reporting equity, uh, majority equity interests in legally separate entities. Um, University of Iowa has, always, has already indicated it does not apply to them, um, nor to UNI, but the Iowa State University is still kind of looking to see if this, if this one will impact them, probably minimally if it does. Next slide. Statement 93. Um, this one is not effective. Some things are effective in 21, some in 22, but they are phasing out the uh, interbank offer rates, often referred to as the IBOR. And, and we, a lot of the um, agreements I've seen in Iowa actually use the London interbank offered rate, the LIBOR. So this is getting phased out. So this standard um, just provides some guidance to those governments that have entered into agreements that use an IBOR as a benchmark um, for variable payments. I, uh, Iowa State and, and you and I um, are still looking through the standard to see if there's anything that pertains to them. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the University of Iowa, there shouldn't be an impact. They had a lease agreement that had a LIBOR rate, but that's been paid off in August of 20, so it shouldn't impact them. Next slide. Gatsby Statement 87. Um, this one we've talked about a lot over the last couple of years. Um, this is the one that's going to add a pretty significant liability to uh, most government's financial statements, including the universities. So um, it, it's the one that gets rid of, uh, we used to have operating leases and capital leases. We now just have leases. And this standard walks us through how to record an asset. Um, a right to use asset for those leases and a corresponding liability. <clears throat> and likewise, if the universities lease property to another party, there will be a receivable and um, that revenue will be deferred over time. So the universities, um, if they haven't start, most of them have started, I know University of Iowa is pretty far along in figuring out what their leases are. Um, Iowa State has indicated they're looking at Workday to see if it can help them facilitate a means to, to start tracking all of their leases. Um, so that they're aware of it, they're, um, they're working to um, determine the impact and, and get ready uh, for implementation. Next slide. Statement 89, this is one of my favorite that Gasby's ever issued um, because it says we get to stop doing something that we've been doing, not effective till 22. And I don't think there's any, uh, there's no talk of early implementing this one. Um, but what this standard does is it, it allows us to stop capitalizing um, interest costs that are incurred before the end of a construction period. That was only ever um, capitalized in business type activities, which is what your universities are, but in the governmental activities, which is what most the state of Iowa is, it's not never been a requirement. So there wasn't consistency. So this standard makes, makes the reporting more consistent. Just one last thing um, that, that we'll need to do. Uh, next slide. The next couple slides discuss GASB 97. Um, it's, a, there's a, few provisions that are effective immediately, but nothing that impacts the universities. Um, so this one has to do with um, reporting fiduciary component units, and it, and it could have an impact on the universities, have to look at their component units. Um, but it also specifically, next slide, addresses um, 457 plans and how to report those as either pensions or employee benefit plans. So again, down the road a ways. Um, so I don't think the universities have looked a lot at that one. 
Next slide. Statement 91. Um, this is pretty far down the road in 23, but just to, to make you aware. Um, in practice, um, conduit debt obligations have always existed, and that's where one entity would issue debt on behalf of another entity. Um, so, and reporting in practice has always been inconsistent. So this standard just makes it consistent. Essentially, it says this conduit debt is not a liability of the entity that issues it, and then adds some disclosure requirements to explain the debt and the entity's relation to that debt. Next slide, statement 94. This statement, again, not effective till 23, um, gives us some guidance for reporting for uh, public-private and public-public partnerships. So this is one that obviously will impact the University of Iowa's P3 arrangement. Um, I, I haven't spoken or we haven't spoken with university folks in terms of early implementation but I doubt that it will get early implemented just because it also will impact state of Iowa and they're probably not as far along with um, some of these provisions and things that they need to do. But again, it provides us some guidance when it's time to implement on how we report those types of arrangements. And then the last GASB is statement 96, again, not effective till 23, but um, it, it does for subscription-based technology arrangements, the same thing that the um, GASB 87 does for leases. Essentially, it says you have to book an intangible asset related to these and a corresponding subscription liability. So, so just kind of a quick overview of, of what's coming down the road that kind of keeps financial folks and auditors busy or financial statement preparers busy. So um, questions on any of those GASBs before I move on? I always appreciate an update, Marlis. Thank you. Yes. Does anyone right. have any questions? Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, next slide. So for the fiscal 20, audit just to, to kind of talk through approach a little bit. Um, as you know, for the universities, we do full scope audits. We issue um, full set of financial statements in their reports. Um, those incorporate the foundations and component units of the universities. We don't audit all those, but we, those do get pulled into their reports and we refer to those other auditors. Um, we always use a risk-based approach and those risks um, can change year to year and we evaluate what those are. We have meetings to sit down and talk about what's going on and, and determine where those risk areas are. Um, this year for 20, as you can imagine, um, COVID-19 has created a couple risk areas that we've already identified and plan to focus on. One is the um, internal control cycles. So um, what can happen and what we're anticipating is because uh, folks started working from home um, and folks focus is taken a little bit off of maybe what their normal duties are to take care of some other things related to the pandemic and that can cause breaks in an internal control system. So uh, we'll probably be looking pretty closely at the March, April timeframe of 2020 when the pandemic actually hit and just making sure that um, there were plans in place to, to keep the holes filled in the internal control system to safeguard um, the assets. The other risk area would obviously be the COVID-19 expenditures that happened from March through December, as well as the funding related to those. The, the funding came out pretty quickly and the guidance um, followed lagged a little bit behind the funding coming out. So um, just we'll want to make sure that, that we're looking at that and, and making sure that, that everyone followed the guidance when it did finally come out. Um, we, we always try to coordinate with Patrice. We don't want to duplicate um, looking in depth at any departments that her department might be planning to do. Um, if it's something we feel we need to do to give an opinion or support our opinion on the financials, we certainly will. 
uh, but we but we always cover with her what her team's doing um, for the coming year. So we'll do that again. Already mentioned internal controls. We'll review those. Um, that's that's a part of every audit. Um, every audit includes testing those controls so that uh, we can see that what we're being told happens is actually what happens. Um, we can rely on that a little bit. If it's a, if it's a fairly strong um, control system as auditors, we can rely on that and kind of change our testing a little bit or cut back a little bit on our testing depending on um, how strong the system is. Um, that review of controls also involves um, federal dollars. So um, the federal requirements require pretty strict controls be in place over the federal dollars. So we look at those as well. And then of course we, we perform the single audit compliance procedures every year and would anticipate COVID being a part of that um, for sure. Next slide. Uh, we will issue, uh, as I mentioned, separate financials for each university. Um, as far as I, I know, we've never modified an opinion on the universities, so I would anticipate um, unmodified opinions again, which is essentially a clean opinion. Um, then about February, we issue what's called an internal control letter or a SAS 122 letter. Um, that letter includes um, internal control findings that we find not just at universities, but at the state, any state department. Um, uh, and again, as, as far back as I can recall or have seen, we've not had any findings in that letter for the universities themselves. And then this time of year, we issue reports of recommendations and we'll plan to do that again. And those reports include um, some student data, but they also include if there's any internal control areas or compliance areas that didn't really rise to the level of a formal reporting, um, in a, in a report required by our standards, um, then we would communicate that in that, that report of recommendations. Okay. We also um, have done in the past and intend to do this year our information technology reviews. So um, if we have findings to report, which the last couple of years we have not, um, if, but if we do have findings, we will report those also in what we call a report of recommendations. And then we also uh, will issue the state of Iowa single audit report, which will in include the universities and, and any of the small regions institutions that receive federal dollars. Okay, next slide. For the three smaller regents institutions, we perform a little um, more limited in scope audits. We, we look pretty closely at their internal controls. Um, we review and test their significant accounting transaction cycles and compliance. And then we'll include them, like I said on the previous slide, in our single audit procedures if, if it applies to them. Um, for those three entities, they're included in the statewide CAFR. Um, in terms of the financial report, but this time of year we issue individual reports or recommendations on those three institutions as well, and we we'll plan to do that again. All right, next slide. This kind of shows the breakdown of, of our plan. Um, we put our budget together um, and then, and we sort of break it down into these main areas of an audit. Um, so that we can kind of identify, well, how much of our time is invested in each of these different areas. Typically, year to year, these percentages are gonna stay fairly close. Um, the one that varies probably the most is the single audit. Um, last year, these percentages would have been higher um, just because um, we audited in fiscal 19, the student financial aid program was a major program and that's a huge program and takes significant time to audit. Um, increased our audit hours um, quite a bit. So that in, that for last year increased our percentage. This year it's gone down some. Um, I imagine COVID funding, CARES funding will be um, part of our major programs, but not as, not as extensive as the student financial aid program. Okay, next slide. Our timeline, um, this is pretty similar to what we've done um, in the past, 
I think a couple of the managers changed a couple things slightly, but really nothing significant. Um, the staffing for the University of Iowa, Gwen Fangman will manage that again this year. She's one of our newer managers, but she in charge that audit for as many years and is very familiar with the, the people there and with the records and systems. Um, her in charge is Jesse Harthen, who also has worked at the university several years. Um, the Iowa State audit will be managed by Janet Mortweet. Um, she spent many years in charging that engagement and then when she was promoted, she became manager. Our in charge is again, Ashley Mosier. Um, she, Ashley is part-time so we are also going to have Jenna Payson, who um, actually in charge is the DOT audit now, but she's worked um, many years on the um, university as well. So she's gonna kind of help Ashley so that we can kind of keep up with what needs to get done by, by the time our reports need to get issued. And then you and I, um, last year you and I was managed by Brian Bruskern. Um, he has since been promoted. He is our IT director now. So um, Michelle Meyer will manage that engagement this year. And she's been the manager of it in the past. So she's very familiar with the university. Um, and um, Kelly Hilton will in charge it again. She was, she was our in charge last year. So questions on any of that timing or, or approach? Anyone have any questions? No? Okay. All right, next slide. Okay, this slide shows um, since 2013, um, the hours and the uh, cost for the financial part of the university and regents institutions audits. So um, this doesn't include any performance hours or special investigation. This is just the financial audit. So, um, and, it, and it shows also what we anticipate for fiscal 20. Now you'll notice, um, well, I think I discussed last year that 28 was, fiscal 28 was 2018, sorry, was an anomaly year because that year there were some administrative hours in our office that we typically spread out to all state agencies, not just universities, and we didn't get that done. So <laughs> we didn't spread those costs or hours. But um, so fiscal 17 um, is really more of a normal audit year. Um, in 2019, you'll you see that the hours went up pretty significantly. Um, that was due to a few things. Um, one, uh, the P3 contracts, we kind of started looking into the, uh, those and, and starting our audit on, on trying to get those agreements and, and looking at that whole issue. Um, we issued two different bond audits during the fiscal year, one for Iowa State uh, for their athletic facilities and uh, one for UNI for utility bonds that they were issuing. And then we issued related to UNI, we issued a, a financial statement report uh, for their utility bonds. Now next year in fiscal 20, we won't have to issue a separate report for those bonds, they will become part of the segment information that's in the audit report. But for that first year, because of timing, the, the regular audit report was already out. Um, we had to issue that separate report, okay. Other things, um, Workday certainly um, had an impact on our 2019 audit time. And I think it continues to, um, we're working with Iowa State University, but it's just, you know, it's all new to everybody and trying to get the reports that are needed and, and get things reconciled. So um, I would anticipate that that will um, impact the fiscal 20 audit as well um, moving forward. And then COVID-19, we started looking at some uh, expenditures related to that, um, just, just kind of got started on that and some of the funding that came through early on. For fiscal 20, um, not quite back down to what would be considered normal hours. Oh, the other thing for fiscal 19, I'm sorry, was the student financial aid program. That was pretty significant. That was just over a thousand hours for that program alone. 
additional hours um, just because it's so, so significant. So for fiscal 20, it's not quite back down to normal, but some of the things that we're anticipating um, that are gonna take some additional time. Again, the P3 agreement and, and everything related to that, the university defeased its utility bonds. So that's gonna take some additional time for us to, to look through that. Implementation of statement 84, um, workday, as I mentioned, will, will continue to impact um, what we're looking at and, and um, what we need for audit. And then the care dollars um, will play into that as well. Okay, questions on fiscal 20 um, audit approach or, or the fees or, or anything that I've talked about so far. Does anyone have any questions? Marlis, I'm curious um, on this page 20, the fees and expenses, um, do you ever break those down? We have by institution, by yes. So we would have that broken down for you know, Iowa State, University of Iowa, Board of Regents, Department, DEF. Yes, we do. I'm curious if the expenses have gone down since people have been home since COVID. Would we have less or are the expenses rising? Um, our travel expenses should be going down. And we are, we are actually anticipating fewer. We're budgeting for fewer travel costs um, that started in late 20. So we'll kind of have to see what kind of impact that has. Um, and actually moving forward, um, you know, Rob told our staff from day one that um, he's interested in us working from home or from wherever, if that saves costs and we're able to do that efficiently. So even moving forward, we're hopeful that our staff can continue to work um, from our Lucas Building office or um, some location other than having to travel. So that I'm hoping that that will help costs even moving forward. Now that does that does put more on the accounting staff at the universities and the different departments because they're having to. Um, provide us information electronically, which the universities are kind of used to that. Um, so I, I don't think for them um, it's, it's causing, they may disagree, <laughs> and, but I don't think for them it's causing a lot more because they're kind of used to providing and we've got, a, we've got a secure portal for them to sort of drop financial information into. But you know, we can't do everything in an audit remotely. There's some things we have to physically look at. So there will always be times when we'll be sending staff out um, to be able to look at original documents, go through internal controls, you know, look at internal control systems and things, but um, hoping uh, to reduce the travel costs some. That also, you know, helps reduce our turnover a little bit because being an auditor, that's a big piece of it or always has been is the travel. And it's hard to keep good qualified folks um, uh, when in a job like that, especially when they start to have families. So that's kind of our goal. The reason that I asked about the breaking out, if you could, the fees and expenses is because I see that your average rate per hour is 85, 87. I'm not sure if that went up or down this past year or- um, it did go up um, and, and I had talked to P Patrice about that a little bit or had emailed back and forth. Um, so what impacts that is we have, um, we have costs, certain costs that are obviously all state agencies do that are out of our control, like OCIO and DAS um, billings across the board rate increases. We get a small appropriation. It, like a lot of places, it never goes up, sometimes goes down. And so we have to cover all of our in, otherwise increasing costs through what we bill. And we also, as I mentioned, it's tough to keep competitive um, 
folks and, and trained folks on staff without being competitive with our salaries. So we always try to do that. We don't, we're reasonable with it, but, but we do the best we can. So that, that average rate per hour um, tends to go up just because we have to increase billings to meet all of our costs. I understand. Thank you for explaining the uh, hours and why they went up so much sure. from 18 to 19, because that's a, you know, clearly sticks out. Does anyone have any questions? All right. Thank you. Do you yeah. want to yeah. go into the state audit reports then? Sure. Next slide. And next slide. Okay, so for um, fiscal 19 engagements, this kind of identifies for you uh, what we issued for reports um, for the board's approval. We issued um, separate financials for the universities. We did give unmodified opinions again this year. Um, we had no findings in the internal control letter that I talked about earlier. Um, and we recently issued the reports of recommendations on those um, on all of the six regents institutions. We had a finding in, I believe it was Braille and Sight Saving School on some underreported revenues um, in their GAP package, but that was the only finding on any of the um, institutions. Um, we issued the single audit report for fiscal year 2019. Um, again, we had no findings for the Regents institutions in terms of, and those would be if we found non-compliance with any of the federal requirements, or we found weaknesses in, in the internal control systems that, that were strong enough that they would rise to the level of needing to be reported, we, we did not find any of those. Um, I mentioned earlier, we issued bond reports for UNI and ISU um, with an unmodified or a clean opinion. Um, we issued a utility enterprise financial report for UNI, just that um, should be the only year it has to be done um, because next year that information can be incorporated in their regular financial audit. Again, an unmodified opinion. Um, then one thing that I forgot to mention earlier is for SUI, um, we issued a report and an, actually an examination report on their transit, on their CAM bus. That's a report that's due once every 10 years and they're required to have an auditor attest to um, some of their information for their transit system. We did actually have a modified conclusion in that report because their report to the transit folks omitted certain revenues. Um, they were fairly material. So, and, but that report won't be due for another 10 years or so. And then I've already mentioned the reports and recommendations. Those were recently issued also on the three smaller regents institutes. And I mentioned Braille had the one finding otherwise, otherwise no finding. So, so that kind of wraps up the fiscal 19 engagement. Question. Okay. Any questions? Thanks, Marlis. We appreciate you uh, being here and for giving us this update. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. I appreciate it. I'll next recognize Chief Audit Executive Patrice Sayre to present the FY 2020 audit progress and FY 2021 internal audit plans. Well, good afternoon. Annually, internal audit reports on our accomplishments for the past year and our plans for the current year. Uh, we are the only state entity that has its own internal audit function. So along with the estimated 18,500 hours you just heard Marlis Gaston talk about that the audit of the state will do at our campuses. We will spend in the internal audit department um, 26,800 plus hours uh, also doing audit. Uh, while the auditor of state really concentrates on financial auditing, we concentrate on operational auditing. Ideally, we're a staff of 16 people. Uh, that includes managers and a part-time administrative support person. On page two, you see a table there that talks about our planned versus completed audits. Now, as the campus dealt with COVID-19, we had to do a lot of adjustments. We also went home like everyone else did. Um, it meant that there were more probably carryover and deferred audits this year. 
there were some observations or some inventories we weren't able to do. So we had to do a certain amount of adjustment. Um, we also did lose almost 850 hours worth of vacancy. Uh, and I'm regretful of saying that we have a vacancy at Iowa State again at this time, but we are actually auditing, uh, I'm sorry, interviewing um, this week. So that's keeping fingers crossed. Uh, in order to create that annual audit plan, we do extensive interviews across the campus with key leadership staff. Again, recognizing the need for those campus leaders to focus on pandemic planning. Many of our conversations were shortened in hopes that we might be able to visit with those people later yet even this year, and maybe uh, have more time for them to talk to us about their audit concerns and their audit needs. Uh, we did leave some considerable unassigned audit time in the plan, you will see. But we still go back and we look at past audit history. Uh, we survey current trends nationwide. We take um, things that we think are important and we risk rank them. Each potential audit gets a point system uh, to ensure that we make, sh make sure that our limited hours are deployed the best they can be. You may have a topic on one campus that risk ranks high and they will include it and the same topic will be discussed maybe at another campus, but there are other audits that might score higher and it will actually fall lower down on that university's plan. We do spend a lot of time together um, as the managers going and comparing our plans against each other. Uh, we do a lot of self critique as well as critiquing um, our, our, um, our cohorts uh, to make sure that we are using the, the very best um, of our resources and trying to focus on what we think really is, is, is the best. Um, in our plan, you'll see that on, on table, um, I'm sorry, page three, we have 70 audits planned. Um, those titles are listed in the following pages. We do not do continuous cycle counts. For instance, we don't continually go in and sample payroll or purchasing. There are other areas that will do it. The Auditor of State will do a lot of work in that area. Um, we really try to, again, focus on original work for each audit, uh, looking at things that have impact our mission, our financial loss, perhaps, um, legal or regulatory issues that have come up, complexity. We also look at things that impact the reputation of our campuses. Um, so the plan is before you today. I've also included a history of audits done at each university for the past, I think it's four years there. And happy to entertain any questions you may have about progress we made this year and what we are, are currently working on um, for the current year. Any questions? All right, continue on. Okay, thank you. Well, I want to talk a bit about internal audit reports that were issued. Um, since our last report, which now really is back in June, uh, we did complete at the University of Iowa eight audit reports and seven follow-up memos. At Iowa State, we got one audit report and one follow-up done, and that at UNI, we did one follow-up. As I had mentioned earlier, we do have an open position at Iowa State uh, that became open in July. So we are hopefully <laughs> having someone to replace. These are these are very wonderful jobs in that you get to know your campus very well. And, and it's always nice when our auditor actually goes in to work for another department. And this particular auditor who uh, had become a very good IT auditor is working at Iowa State IT. So <laughs> we're, uh, we're happy for his future. Um, wanted to uh, just highlight a little bit some of the audits. Um, Iowa completed three audits concurrently in the healthcare area. It was the Department of Ana Anesthesia, the Department of Surgery, and the UI healthcare operating rooms. Now, completing these audits together was necessary to understand the complex and the integrated processes involved for inpatient and outpatient surgery. There are multiple process dependencies that make it important for the processes to work efficiently in order to fully utilize those operating rooms and the healthcare staff. Our findings did identify areas for improvement in the evaluation and correction of controllable delays, including late arrival of personnel uh, to operating rooms. Uh, quite often, it would be the first surgery of the day that would then throw the schedule off for the rest of the day. Um, 
We also had um, delays occurred because history and physical forms or other consent forms were incomplete or maybe nursing assessment had not been completed in a timely manner. Another area for improvement included inconsistent data entry into a patient's medical record regarding case delay reasons or patient class designation and patient access data not being fully accurate or used, utilized for management decisions. And finally, the release of unused operating room time slots or underutilization of ambulatory surgical center time slots uh, by the Department of Surgery didn't happen in a timely manner, so those slots could then be reused by others. Uh, that has to obviously be weighed against the need to hold open emergency operating rooms for unexpected traumas or emergent surgeries. Uh, management is responding to these interrelated issues by meeting with administration folks and addressing these shortcomings. Uh, this is a large process and, and takes many uh, people to function, uh, but they are already meeting and working through issues. The other audit at the University of Iowa I'd like to mention about is Title IX. Now this audit took place before the new regulations were in place. However, the findings are valid as they found that multiple Title IX policies and procedures are overlapping, duplicate, they're inconsistent, or sometimes even contradictory. Um, they were not centrally published and there, uh, there was resulting confusion on proper contacts for incidents or inquiries. Overall, the decentralized process and support from different departments and systems was really not working smoothly. Um, the Title IX coordinator is working to create a single interim policy and procedure and redefining those working relationships. Uh, this will include ensuring that several data systems uh, that are used are reconciled against each other, that timeframes match in those systems, that data is consistently retained, that we have job duties and training requirements that are clearly defined and documented, and that training and building access is also documented. Moving to Iowa State University, uh, we did a Department of Music and Theater. The purpose of this audit was to provide reasonable assurance that processes and internal controls are in place and, and functioning effectively for the department. We want to track private music lessons, uh, look at background checks for minors, ensure that conflict of interest documents are signed on file, and ensure that student fees are properly levied and documented. We did find that a process for documenting private music lessons by faculty members was absent. We found the department did not track background checks, did not have signed parental permission agreements or emergency contact information on file. These things may have existed, but they didn't exist in one easy place to get to. And while not required, we also found that facility use agreements um, were not being used to track which department spaces and assets were being used for private lessons. Management's agreed to work with the Office of Risk Management to ensure that these policies and procedures um, in order to reduce risk are adopted. We also looked at cash handling procedures and they were not robust. Um, whether it was cash being taken on road trips to distribute to the um, band members and, and students or cash being collected at a site while on a road trip, we found that they did not have good measures in place. Uh, management is working with the treasurer's office and also explode, um, exploring student per diem cards to be assigned through the US bank. We also found there were some incorrect signatories on contracts. We did find missing conflict of interest forms and commitments and inadequate review and justification of accumulated music activity fees. All of these things are being addressed by management. I'd be happy to address any questions on audit or those uh, follow-ups if you have any questions. Does anyone have any questions? I had one question on the Title IX audit. Yes. Um, you mentioned uh, the advantages of uh, consolidating policies uh, uh, in, into a single policy. Do you have a view on whether there would be advantages to consolidating and regularizing policies across the three universities? No, I honestly would not uh, feel qualified to, to pass judgment on that. Um, looking at the Title IX at the University of Iowa, what we found is that there just um, still was some disconnects in how departments work with each other 
and the Title IX coordinator's um, authority flowing across all entities. Again, can be fixed, uh, I just, but I would not say that I'm, I have an opinion on Title IX across the three counties. Thank you. Any other questions? I would right. point out one last thing, I'm sorry. The um, audit follow-up status, there is a red one called at the University of Iowa, the emergency preparedness. We have been able to close that since this report was issued. So it will come off on the uh, November report, but we're glad to have it closed and let you know that uh, it's been resolved. Good. Do you wanna go on with the internal audit charter? Yes. Finally, we, we ask every year for the board to take a look at our charter. Um, this is what guarantees kind of our rights and, and procedures, uh, maintains our independence, allows us to uh, audit anything that is appropriate. And we just ask once again that the board commit to supporting internal audit in this manner and that this internal audit charter be adopted again this year. There are no changes from last year. Thanks, Patrice. Any questions for Patrice? Or any other business to come before the committee? So hearing none, I'd like to make a motion that the Audit and Compliance Committee recommend that the board receive the following items. FY 2020 State Audit Plan, State Audit Reports, and Internal Audit Reports issued and that the board receive and approve the following items, FY 2020 audit progress and FY 2021 internal audit plans and the internal audit charter renewal that Patrice just talked about. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Regent Bates for that second. The audit and compliance committee is now adjourned. Uh, thank you, Regent Dunkel, and thanks to all the presenters. <clears throat> now I'd like to recognize uh, Regent Bates, who will run the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics Committee meeting. Thank you, President Richards. Um, our first item is approval of the minutes from the June 4th, 2020 meeting. Are there any questions or corrections? If not, the minutes are approved by general consent. And now I'll recognize Dr. Brooks Jackson, Vice President for Medical Affairs and Tyrone D. Arts Dean, Carver College of Medicine. I'll turn the, the floor over to you, Dr. Jackson and your team. Welcome. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Regent Banks. And uh, good afternoon to, to you and, and the other regents. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to be here today, and I'm joined today by Associate Vice President and Chief Executive Officer for UI Hospitals and Clinics, Suresh Gunasekran, Associate Vice President for Finance and UI Healthcare's Chief Financial Officer, Brad Hawes, and our faculty presenter, Dr. Stanley Perlman, Professor of Microbiology and Immunology, whom I will introduce uh, more fully a bit later. The focus of our presentation today will be on UI Healthcare's continued and continually evolving response to the pandemic crisis. It has been quite frankly, something of a roller coaster ride. Back in early June, when we gave our last report to the board, we shared accolades for the incredible work our team was doing to learn how to work in the new normal imposed by the COVID pandemic. That outstanding work has continued as the pandemic has evolved and we could not be prouder of our amazing team for their efforts to lead the response to the COVID-19 crisis. Back in June, we also shared concerns about uh, what was shaping up to be a very dire financial situation. And although we had a very strong first half of the fiscal year, our volumes plummeted when the pandemic hit and we saw revenue sharply decline at the same time some expenses increased. Many factors contributed to this most notably on the revenue side, the temporary but necessary suspension of elective procedures, and on the cost side, the purchase of essential supply chain items, such as vital personal protective equipment for employees, COVID-19 testing materials, 
in screening thermometers at our, our entrances. During the early months of the pandemic, we were able to establish several new protocols and protective measures that allowed us to operate as safely as possible, and we have continued to make enhancements where appropriate. Some of these changes involve the implementation of visitor restrictions and health screenings at our building entry points, reconfig reconfigured workstations, break rooms and cafeterias to support enhanced social distancing, work from home protocols for select employees who could fulfill their duties remotely, and much more. And as a result of these changes, we truly believe that we are now one of the safest places in Iowa, and we want all Iowans to know we stand ready to meet their healthcare needs. Thanks to the tremendous hard work of our team, we successfully returned to pre-pandemic pre volume levels in many areas, and along with modest levels of coronavirus relief funding, we were able to end the year with a positive margin. This is good news for our healthcare system, but it is even better news for the people of Iowa who rely on us for their healthcare. In fact, as you'll hear from Suresh, we are once again reaching full capacity and effectively bursting at the seams, a trend we were seeing pre-pandemic and one which continues as Iowans seek the vital healthcare services that our academic medical center provides. It is important to note that we are not full with COVID-19 patients, which has remained relatively stable in the low 20s, 20, number of 20 inpatients per day but rather driven by patients facing other healthcare needs, especially the most complex cases requiring the unique services that are often only available at academic medical centers like ours. So the situation remains quite fluid. And as such, we are approaching these early months of FY21 with an abund abundance of cautious optimism. Still, there are certainly some positives on the horizon as we enter this new phase of the pandemic. In addition to some of the treatments like remdesivir, convalescent plasma, and steroids that appear to be effective in ameliorating the impact of the disease, the data emerging on the leading COVID-19 vaccine candidates currently in large phase three clinical trials in the US looks very promising. As you know, UI Healthcare is one of the sites around the world enrolling subjects in the Pfizer trial under the superb leadership of Dr. Patricia Winokur and we recently completed our target enrollment for the trial. So it's truly exciting and rewarding to be part of this historic scientific effort that holds perhaps the greatest promise for us to turn the corner on this pandemic. While it is vital that we let the science lead these efforts to ensure that any vaccine meets the nation's existing high standards for safety and efficacy, and while it is difficult to predict the timing of vaccine approval, we are beginning now to work to plan for the logistics of COVID-19 vaccine distribution in coordination with the Iowa Department of Public Health. This groundwork will ensure that we can be ready to administer rapidly one or more COVID-19 vaccines when the time comes. On the academic front, we are pleased that our students and researchers in the Carver College of Medicine have successfully returned to campus over uh, the last few months with most student, students and trainees engaged in in-person learning. This has required creativity and cooperation on the part of our faculty and staff, as well as learners. And while we have shifted to new ways of learning and working, we are encouraged and grateful to see our collective research and education efforts progressing quite smoothly. It is perhaps fitting that the challenges we have overcome these past several months arrived at a very special time in the life of the Carver College of Medicine as this year, back this past Sunday, September 20th, marks the college's 150th anniversary, having opened on September 20th, 1870. Although 2020 has not shaped up to be the year any of us had hoped for, and we had to make a number of pivots in our planned ses sesquicentennial celebration, I think it is still important that we take time to reflect on the vital role the college has played in the life of Iowa and as a leader in the field of medicine and to dream big about the opportunities that lie ahead. Towards that end, we were delighted to host earlier this week a virtual keynote address <clears throat> with a figure long familiar and highly regarded on our campus. Dr. David Scorton, president of the Association of American Medical Colleges and former president here at the University of Iowa gave a wonderful lecture on the future of academic medicine in a post COVID world and provided a great deal of food for thought as we contemplate our next 150 years. 
In summary, although we know our pandemic journey is not over yet, we are encouraged by signs of, the, of light at the end of the tunnel, and we remain tremendously grateful to the UI healthcare team for their tremendous work to sustain our vital tripartite mission during this challenging time. Before I turn things over to Suresh and Brad, I just want to update the board on one more piece of critical work we have undertaken that will significantly influence our ability to succeed in the future. And that is our collective work to ensure that we provide an environment that is diverse, equitable, and inclusive. The events of this year have sparked a long overdue examination of racial inequality in the US and like other organizations, we have taken the opportunity to turn the lens on ourselves to better understand our role and responsibility in this most important arena. After hosting a series of listening sessions for our employees and learners earlier this year, we established a diversity, uh, equity and inclusion or DI task force, uh, co-chaired by me and Dr. Mar Denise Martinez, our Associate Dean for DEI in the college. The task force comprises three committees focused on recruitment and retention, healthcare disparities and patient initiated um, uh, identity uh, harassment and our workplace climate and environment. The task force has been charged with developing and implementing strategies that will make a measurable difference for all marginalized faculty, staff, and trainees, including Black, Indigenous, and people of color at UI Healthcare. This effort is a top priority for the institution, and the task force is expected to finalize its recommendations by the end of the calendar year. We are committed to making meaningful progress in this area, and we will look forward to reporting on our efforts as this critical work unfolds. With that, I'd like to now ask Suresh and Brad to share with you more of the details of our financial and operational picture as we start the new fiscal year. Thank you. Before uh, Brad gets started, I'll, uh, I'll just make a few comments. I, I do appreciate everyone's time. Great to see everyone, at least virtually. Um, a couple of things that I just wanted to say off the top, three things really. One, um, I, I think it should it should really be obvious at this point, but it's been uh, remarkable to, to navigate these times under the leadership of, of Dr. Jackson. Um, he uh, is almost well suited to stay calm uh, during this uh, pandemic, given his tremendous uh, clinical expertise um, and academic expertise in this area that's really served us well. But I, I wanted folks to know that it wasn't just the research and academic side in the, in the command center every day um, here, Brooks was here. Um, Brooks was here on the weekends, helping on clinical service. And I think uh, a lot of uh, our leaders um, being willing to, to to go through this is really what's gotten us uh, through this. And I and I want to really thank and recognize Brooks for those efforts. Second, uh, I want to thank the, uh, President Harold uh, for creating a culture of collaboration because it has been truly collaborative um, in this marathon effort. Um, all of campus has rallied together, um, whether it's on health issues, whether it's on student issues or faculty issues. Um, no one has hesitated to pick up the phone or walk across the hall and have the, the tough conversations that we have to, to have to get through these, uh, these times. So I, I wanna thank President Harold. And then the, the final piece is I wanna thank all the staff. Um, we, we've had a significant number of staff that have gone above and beyond without any regard um, to, uh, uh, issues of stamina, uh, personal concern, uh, understanding that our missions are to, to educate the next, next generation, to take care of those Iowans that are in need. And most importantly, I think we'll, we'll hear from Dr. Perlman and others uh, that are on the front of advancing real solutions to real problems that, that the world needs to see. And so um, today we're going we're gonna to talk through some pretty um, steady issues, but uh, I did want to at least take a moment to reflect on, on, on some of the great people that have, that have made this possible. But uh, as usual, we'll turn over the most exciting portion of our presentation to, to Mr. Brad Hawes. Uh, I will attempt to uh, stay awake during this. I wish you luck as well. As, as Sherry knows, it, it wouldn't be a finance presentation without Suresh <laughs> commenting about the excitement. Um, we, we have had a, a town hall presentation that Suresh has given multiple times. It starts with the concept of the best of times and the worst of times. And so uh, we, as, as Dr. Jackson had mentioned, 
going into the pandemic, we uh, were actually having a, an, an amazing year. Volumes very, very high, uh, really at capacity. We were far, far ahead of budget when our February year to date numbers. Uh, and then when uh, March came and the pandemic came in full force and surgeries were canceled, we had a very different experience. And I remember our team running some initial analysis about the impact of uh, reduced cases. And we, we did an analysis of just the surgeries and then later realized that reduced surgeries would also lead to lower admissions. And uh, I remember uh, going home and, and telling my wife one night, we're, we're losing about two and a half million dollars a day. Uh, we, we were losing a revenue. We weren't able to staff down because we were uh, preparing for what many anticipated would be a wave of, of, of illness. And uh, obviously the, the focus of, of leadership was to do the right thing, but the financial implications at that point were, were incredible. Uh, and then when uh, those restrictions were lifted in, in May and June, uh, the, the house became extremely busy again, not only with COVID patients, but with folks who had delayed essential care, sometimes called elective. Uh, I think we sometimes call it schedulable, but May and June were very strong. Um, and then with the impact of some stimulus funding, we actually ended up pretty well. So uh, next slide. This is a summary. I'm going to give you two looks. This is our year end summary for fiscal year 20. And then I'll show you what we look like in July and August. So as you can see here, the operating margin for the full year, uh, we actually ended uh, ahead of our budget, which I think is remarkable with a 4.5% operating margin versus a budget of 3.9%. And so you would you look at the next bullet with the volume changes that you see there and you would think, well, with discharges, days, surgeries, and clinic visits down, how would that have happened? And it would not have happened without a large uh, influx of funding from the federal government. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but that essentially offset uh, a portion of our reduced revenue and increased expenses. Um, and the fact that we were ahead of budget through February helped us uh, end up where we were. Uh, on acuity, this is a reoccurring theme. Uh, you'll hear more about it from Suresh, but a case mix index of 2.32, uh, if not our all-time high, is very close, simply indicating that we are seeing sicker and sicker patients uh, and that they're more resource intensive in terms of what we need, uh, uh, not what we need, but what we plan for. Um, payer mix is something we're watching closely. Uh, we have worried with job loss and the economic impact of the, of the pandemic that we would see more indigent care and Medicaid. Uh, we have not seen that either through this year uh, or in the first two months of fiscal year 21. Uh, we actually see a, a slight uptick in Medicare, but when you look into next year, that's actually come back down a little bit. So our payer mix has been very, very stable. Um, and then salary expense, you can see there is 2.1% below budget, but that's actually, we were 6.6% ahead of the prior year. And so with that volume and trying to make sure that we're uh, appropriately resourced, we have increased our staffing significantly. We had anticipated even more staffing um, and in many situations have resorted to temporary staff to fill uh, some of the, the areas where we could not uh, find full-time folks. And then the last uh, bullet here, uh, supply and drug costs, you'll see are above budget. Uh, that is actually a result of the fact that our revenues for pharmacy are ahead of budget significantly. Uh, that, become, that has become a growing uh, and very important part of our business. As you read in the national literature, uh, the, the scaling back or the whittling back of the 340B benefits um, in pricing, that will have an impact on us going forward. Uh, our pharmacy revenues are, are a big part of what we do. Revenues up more than the expense, and so that's actually been an enhancement to our margin. Uh, next slide. So in the, in the fiscal year, we received in the hospital and clinics $31.1 million of CARES funding. 
And uh, there are several tranches of CARES funding that have come through. There was an initial very rapid payment. Um, there were later uh, payment uh, streams related to whether they were rural or hot spots or other uh, affected areas. In aggregate, we have this 31 million for last year. Uh, we believe there's another 10 million from last year that were uh, due from the government and we have been following up with our uh, congressional or legislative liaisons uh, in, in the federal space to make sure that that is collected. We have also partnered very closely with the university. Uh, Suresh talked about the collaborative nature uh, piggybacking on their expertise around FEMA. No FEMA money was received in, in fiscal year 20. Uh, a lot of expenses that are eligible for reimbursement have been tracked and submitted, but the application and approval process uh, takes a, a significant amount of time and we would expect payment in FY21, uh, even though the expenses hit in FY20. So next slide, this is our traditional income statement. Um, a lot of numbers that I realize here, so I won't go through uh, each and every one of those, uh, but just to orient you to some of the highlights, uh, our revenues, uh, which include um, the CARES money, the CARES funding would show up in other operating revenue on this statement uh, in a $53 million variance to prior year or the $31 million variance to budget. That's where you see the CARES money. With that money, our revenue was actually up $44 million uh, over budget. Uh, our expenses were also up uh, despite being uh, below budget in our salaries and wages, uh, but not up as much as revenue. And so uh, the sophisticated math would say when revenue is up more than expense, the margin improves. And you can see that uh, our margin was 13, almost $14 million ahead of budget, but not quite as good as, as our performance uh, in the prior year. Uh, any questions there? I'll stop. I guess at the end of FY20 to see if anybody has any questions. Brad, this is Jim Lindenmeyer. Uh, I was just curious with on your uh, salaries and wages line, what effect has overtime had on that, if any? Uh, we have significant costs in overtime uh, and, and high staffing. We also have significant costs that would be in the general expense around contract labor. Um, we are trying to manage that as closely as possible. One of the uh, things that I believe Suresh will touch on in his presentation is that uh, the overtime has been enhanced, or I guess higher as we lose staff sometimes to quarantine. Uh, we've had to rely on people that are uh, still here and available for work and asking them to come in and do additional shifts has been a staple of our response to, to the virus. Actually, it's admirable what the staff has been able to do, but it comes at a, at a financial cost and then I think at a personal cost to those folks. Oh, Suresh, you wanna chime in there or you wanna wait? Um, I would just say in this time interval, Regent Lindemeyer, there's not as much as in the subsequent time interval. So this time interval is through June 30th. July, August, September has seen much higher numbers, but frankly, um, the overtime's also being driven by the fact that the schools are virtual and that um, more of our workforce is trying to be flexible and meeting their childcare needs, which is driving over time. Um, at some point, people do have to take vacations. You know, we, we forget in the pandemic that everyone's learning how to work from home and do things remotely, but not hospital workers. They still do it in person. Uh, most patients prefer to have an in-person nurse versus a virtual nurse. And so, you know, those, uh, and we're legally required to have an in-person nurse. And so, uh, you know, that staffing piece has been uh, difficult. The longer this goes on, folks need to be out for vacation, they need to be out for other things. So um, in the current fiscal year, I've authorized up to 100 uh, temporary um, uh, staff to come in uh, to augment that, but that's not in this financial, it'll be in the present financials. Okay, next slide. Uh, these uh, ratios we show to you frequently. I apologize, there's a typo in the operating margin uh, that, that we finished with a 4.5% margin. 
Uh, we have updated the Moody's medians to the report that we just got at the beginning of September. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, all of these margins from a financial perspective in our AA cohort improved. The margin, the benchmark margin went up, the day's cash on hand benchmark went up, and the debt to capitalization ratio actually dropped uh, in our peer institutions. Uh, we have matched improvement. Uh, we talked about the margin, our day's cash on hand ended at 210, and our debt to capitalization ratio uh, at 17.6 uh, has dropped. We have continued to make principal payments. Uh, we did a refinancing uh, in June, and those things have help helped our uh, debt to cap ratio. Uh, so next slide, I won't spend nearly as much time on uh, FY21. Uh, I'll just highlight a couple of things here. Uh, if you go over to the payer mix, I hit, well, it, let me back up, excuse me. Uh, one thing to note for you as we report financially during this year is that we essentially have a budget that we're comparing to internally that uh, marks our performance in a way we would have expected given volume uh, increases, uh, no degradation in payer mix, and really no impact from the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. We do have in our aggregate budget that we uh, do at an aggregate level contingencies for those kinds of things. We have not seen those contingencies yet. And so the results that you'll see versus budget here assume an annual budgeted margin of about 5.1%. In the first couple of months, that bar budgeted margin is 3.8%. Of that 5.1, a lot of times our budget uh, is stronger in the last half of the year. Having said that, um, our operating margin in June, and, or excuse me, in July and August is 7.9%. Very, very strong. And that includes uh, accruals to share back some of the success with our staff and our faculty uh, if the margin continues to be that high uh, in a reward for their uh, amazing efforts in getting us through this, this effort. And so uh, the margin we're actually uh, astounded at, you'll see a little bit later, it's not rocket science, it's related to volume. And, you'll, and it's uh, you know, volume uh, across a fixed expense base always will drive a higher margin. Our payer mix where you had seen Medicare creep up to 38 uh, has dropped again. Uh, we're seeing some increase in the Medicaid rolls. We have statewide data that shows that the Medicaid enrollment has increased significantly, but in terms of our business, Medicaid has not yet increased uh, significantly. Salary expenses are a little bit above budget a year to date, partly because of what we talked about, uh, Regent Linda Meyer. Uh, that's despite the fact that we have asked staff to take unpaid time or to give back vacation as an expense management uh, response to uh, anticipated lower revenues. And most of those things with the staff did not begin until July. So if we flip the, to the next slide, um, we have received in the current year, so separate from last year, $13.7 million of CARES funding. Uh, we're booking that or earning it in accounting speak over the first six months. Uh, and our initial FEMA submission of about 9 million has gotten through the first level of three level review. Uh, we have five other worksheets to submit to FEMA once this is approved uh, and we'll report that funding uh, as it comes in. So there is an impact again, like there was last year of uh, CARES funding and something that uh, it has been vitally important to us. And next slide, our, our income statement. Um, won't spend a lot of time here. Just give you a second to look at it. Revenue's up again, expenses not up at the same rate and a positive margin and positive in the uh, gain and loss on investments. So very strong net margin uh, in total. You do see the footnote at the bottom that what's reflected here is what I described earlier is an internal budget. Um, we do have contingencies that would give our, uh, our aggregate budget 1.9%.
and actually a negative margin for year-to-date August. And then finally, the last slide, uh, their same ratios. Uh, days cash on hand dropped relative to where we were in June for two reasons. We had a very large principal payment in, in August, $22 million. And also as our expense structure grows, the same level of cash that we had previously would mean less days cash on hand. And so essentially, you know, just the simple ratio changes uh, as our denominator goes up, uh, our average daily expense goes up, our day's cash goes on hand, the day cash on hand goes uh, down, and it becomes a, a challenge for us to keep growing that ratio as we try to get closer and closer to the Moody's, Moody's median. So that's where we are through August. September volumes look equally as strong as we've seen uh, in July and August, and uh, doing our best to, to, to work through those. Any questions on the year-to-date financials? Um, I had one question. This is David Barker. Um, uh, looking at the uh, margins and comparing them to the Moody's median, uh, should we interpret that correctly? That uh, should we interpret that the way it looks? That uh, we're now ahead of the median, or has that median been adjusted for recent changes in the marketplace? No, you're 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 exactly right, Regent Barker. Uh, through July and August, uh, we are trending ahead of uh, the AA cohort or our benchmark. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Suresh. Thanks, Brad. Um, I'm not going to thank Brad for uh, that presentation, but I will thank Brad for all of his efforts over the last several months um, uh, in handling um, the continued diligence around the FEMA reporting, the collaboration with the rest of campus, and um, obviously our financial results are, are well. And you, you know, during this period of time, we were also able to get support for uh, another issuance that, that was done pretty successfully, a refinance, if you will. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I wanted to give you a brief update on how things are going with our continued COVID response. The, the real story here is that we continue to raise the bar on our safety standards. Uh, we are doing uh, further precautions in numerous settings, the most visible of which are that now we will uh, require a face shield and an additional face mask in all uh, uh, public and patient care settings on the healthcare campus. Um, we continue to have a substantial success story in our ILI clinic under the leadership of Dr. Doug Van Dale. Um, we have had a flexible and fluid, yet always effective uh, outpatient uh, approach to managing our COVID populations, whether it's testing, whether it is uh, uh, remote therapy, whether it is follow-up. Um, in every instance, uh, we've opened and closed and expanded various different locations under the leadership of Dr. Van Dale. But what we can tell you is that our patients have been served really, really well. And uh, we're very, very proud of um, how we continue uh, to handle that. Uh, we continue to accept all COVID-19 patient transfers, even though um, we are um, in a pretty difficult uh, bed situation, which we'll discuss. Um, my largest concern, my number one priority is to make sure that our staff stays strong throughout this entire um, ordeal. It is a marathon. I hope we've reached the halfway point. Um, we are doing everything that we can to fortify the staff. We are not trying to save money. Um, uh, at different times, we've increased shift premiums uh, for staff so that they can do this. Various different portions of staff with approval from Dr. Jackson have gotten uh, bonus payments for uh, extra work that they have done during the pandemic. Uh, we referenced the success sharing at the end of the year, um, but we're also adding staff, both temporary and permanent. Uh, we're in the middle of a very uh, large push to hire right now, as well as a very large push of temporary workers. The reason we're doing this is that um, uh, we continue to um, uh, see so many demands on our staff. And then while we're doing that, we continue to plan additional inpatient and emergency department space within our present facilities to see if there are ways that we could uh, expand uh, the number of beds or expand the number of spaces that we could treat patients in. Uh, this is not just for the benefit of our COVID patients, which we always wanna have ready for a surge, but it's for all patients. Next slide, please. 
Today, the one topic I wanted to talk through um, is uh, where we are as, a, as Iowa's largest referral center. Uh, in future, uh, the next meeting, we will talk about our patient satisfaction and our quality scores, uh, which we uh, typically do at this meeting. I will give you a little preview to say that in spite of this very challenging year, uh, UIHC substantially improved both its patient satisfaction scores and our uh, quality scores. Um, uh, so we continue to prove that even in the face of high volumes, our care teams can come together and do better. And I would thank uh, Dr. Van Dale, uh, Dr. Terry Brennan, and, and a few others that have helped uh, lead that journey. Um, but today's topic is really how are we doing um, as a strong referral center? And um, we always try to be as transparent with the board as possible. There are many, many things that we're doing well at UIHC, but we also wanna be honest about our challenges and the transfers and the volumes that we're seeing are a challenge. Um, so uh, inpatient transfer volumes have pretty much returned to the same numbers of patients trying to transfer from around Iowa into UIHC as pre-COVID. Unfortunately, those patients are a lot sicker now than the transfers that we were having before, which is why you saw that CMI. Similarly, our emergency department transfer um, uh, rate is also higher, as well as our direct admissions. These are patients that directly need to go into the hospital, don't need to go into the ED. Um, when you look at this, overall what this means is that uh, we are uh, seeing a higher volume of sick patients from around Iowa that need to come to UIHC, and we are struggling to keep up um, after uh, uh, the events of earlier this year. Next uh, slide, please. I just wanted to breeze through these pretty quickly. This is just data to show you that the inbound uh, transfer levels have gone back to exactly what they were before. If you recall, before the pandemic, we were continuing to improve the efficiency of our operations. We were uh, achieving better financial results. And really what we were thinking about is how do we continue to expand capacity when, when there's this much demand? We thought perhaps the pandemic would lessen that demand. As you can see, it only took till about June uh, for it all to come back at the same rate. The unfortunate part is a little bit sicker. Next slide, please. You can see that it's still not Johnson County that's driving the majority of the transfers. Uh, it's broadly Eastern Iowa, but you can still see Des Moines um, and other areas uh, remain very strong referral uh, patterns for these. So uh, this is uh, definitely showing you that nothing's changed after the pandemic. Um, we are Iowa's uh, referral center, not Johnson County's. So the vast majority of the referrals do come from the eastern half of the state, but you can see a significant portion of those come from the northern uh, part of the state as well. So um, increasingly, Iowans are coming to rely on UIHC and they are getting transferred here from hospitals across the state. Next slide, please. Um, this is the case mix index. This is to show that um, when your case mix index during the pandemic is equal to after the peak of the pandemic that tells you everything you need to know, that we are getting extremely sick patients. So when transfers come back at the same rate, but the patients are sicker, what that means is they're coming in, we take them, and on average, they need to stay in the hospital longer, which is what's causing the crunch. Um, so uh, the reason transfers aren't up is because our beds are full. If the, if the, um, the sickness level, the CMI were the same as before the pandemic, transfers would actually be up 10 to 15%. So please know that we're only uh, accepting um, the transfers that we can, which largely means many uh, state uh, hospitals, across, uh, many of the hospitals across the state are disappointed when we decline to take a transfer. And many have complained to me uh, because they believe it's happening at a higher rate than it did before. That's not the case. It's where we, we have sicker patients now than we did before. Next slide. Our daily census has returned to prior levels. Um, I'm not going to stay on this slide. I would just say that uh, the only reason um, that this census piece um, says 726 instead of 759 is that our pediatric volumes are a little bit down. In the pre-COVID period, that was the winter. And our uh, pediatric census always goes up in the winter with respiratory diseases. Right now, it's, it's not big for kids. So otherwise, if you look at the adult census, it's identical to what it was um, before. Next slide, please. Uh, emergency department transfers have increased. So uh, um, next slide, please. 
um, and admissions through the admission uh, uh, the ED are also up, which means that more and more of the patients that are driving to our emergency room, by the way, the majority of those are not from Iowa City, so they're from surrounding counties that drive in. The, there's a marked increase in how much, uh, how many of those patients need to be admitted to the hospital, which means that they're coming to the emergency room and they are much sicker than we traditionally see. Next slide, please. Um, we uh, are, however, here to tell you that although that some of our results in terms of being able to handle these volumes are mixed, um, we are still persevering. I am still optimistic. I still think we can do better. Um, and I know we will, but we need to be honest. Our space capacity issues predate the pandemic and are made worse right now. We've had two months of the worst left without being seen right in our emergency department since I've been here. I uh, regret to tell you that in the month of August that 20% of patients left without being seen, which has never happened. That's a number that usually on our worst day is between seven and 10%, but it really shows you kind of being overrun by patients from out of town. We're also increasing, uh, we're, we're trying to figure out how to manage the increasing volume of behavioral health patients that are in distress and need care. In August, the main reason the left without being seen was so high was the large number of behavioral health patients that were in uh, the ED that we couldn't move because the beds upstairs were completely full. We're working with hospitals across the state to improve the transfer process and see if there are things that we could do better remotely, but many still remain dissatisfied uh, we are, however, confident because there is an opportunity that we control. Um, you know, we can do better at um, uh, discharging patients and getting them ready for discharge sooner. And uh, uh, Dr. Jackson, Dr. Van Dale, and numerous clinical leaders are very committed to doing this, uh, better evaluating our transfers to make sure only the, the appropriate patients come here and when they come here to take care of them and get back, get them back to their home community faster. So. If we did this, there would be more bed capacity as well. But unfortunately, when we look at it, I think there are going to be some future um, planning that we're going to need to do. Next slide, please. Um, I'm happy to take any questions um, on any of these slides uh, before we turn it over to Dr. Perlman. This is David Barker. Um, why do you think the CMI uh, is increasing so much? Uh, I think it's a couple of different issues. One is that we there is gonna be a public health impact to delaying healthcare for three months. So I think a lot of chronic diseases um, didn't get managed as well as they could and they progressed to a, a different state. And so I think that that's definitely it. I think secondarily, a lot of the other state, uh, the hospitals across the state are unable to take care of sicker patients. So more of them are coming to us. So it's both, it's uh, uh, usually what uh, each uh, critical access hospital may have one transfer per month that they send to us, but now they have eight patients that are sicker that they need to transfer to us. So I think those are the two drivers. So the second is a long-term trend, but the first is, is something uh, short-term that we're seeing because of the pandemic. I believe so. I think there is okay. a short-term aspect and a long-term aspect. You're right. Thank you. Regent County. You were on mute. I, I... Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Suresh. Brooks. Okay. Um, so I'm very uh, pleased to present our faculty uh, presenter, Dr. Stanley Perlman, uh, who is a professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology as well as in the Department of Pediatrics. And he is the Mark Stinsky Chair of Virology. And he will be presenting on a very timely uh, research uh, subject. 
Dr. Perlman received his PhD in biophysics from MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and his MD from the University of Miami in Miami, Florida. He was trained in pediatrics and pediatrics infectious diseases at Boston Children's Hospital, Boston, Massachusetts, and he joined the faculty at the University of Iowa in 1983. He is sometimes referred to as the godfather of coronaviruses, as he has spent the past 38 years studying the inner workings of these complex viruses, which most people had never even heard of uh, prior to the start of the COVID-19 epidemic. He stood out as a leader early on in the crisis when he wrote an editorial for the New England Journal of Medicine in February to educate physicians about coronaviruses, and he's also quoted regularly uh, on a range of COVID-19 related subjects by national media outlets, such as the New York Times and ABC News. His current research efforts are focused on coronavirus pathogenesis, including virus-induced demyelination and the severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, the uh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS, and COVID-19. His laboratory has, has developed several novel animal models useful for studying pathogenesis and evaluating vaccines and antiviral therapies. His studies are directed at understanding why age patients and mice develop more severe disease than younger individuals after infection with SARS or SARS-CoV-2, uh, COVID-19, and also on why there is a male predominance in patients with more severe disease after infection with these coronaviruses. He and his colleagues demonstrated that transduction of mice with an adenovirus expressing the human receptor for MERS or DP, DPP4 uh, rendered them sensitive to infection, providing the first rodent model useful for studying MERS. Similar approaches have been used to develop a mouse model for COVID-19, and he has also developed models for the loss of sense of smell, anosmia, observed in patients with COVID-19. So we're very grateful to him for taking the time to be with us today to share more about this fascinating area of research. So at this point, over to you, Stanley. Thank you, Brooks. So I've been working on these uh, viruses for so long, partly because they do and they cause disease in, in a way that's not totally typical of other viruses. So animals or people get sick when the virus is actually being treated appropriately by the host. So the host over-treats uh, the virus. And as a result, people get what's called immunopathological disease, where the host response is actually what causes disease. And that's been a characteristic, I think, of everything I've done for the last uh, 38 years now. Could I have the first slide? But yeah, so the, I'm going to just first start off with a few research questions in general, some of which were alluded to by what Brooke said. So some of the things that are really different about this virus, and I think everybody knows a lot of these already, but I've just mentioned it anyway, which is why is SARS-CoV-2, the agent causing COVID-19, so contagious? It is so different from the SARS coronavirus or the MERS coronavirus. And we know the reason is, is that this virus grows like the cold coronaviruses in the nose and the pharynx. So because of that, they're easily spread and in fact, they're spread by people who are going to get sick, but are not sick yet, people that are called in the pre-symptomatic phase. So we wanna know why does this virus, which looks so much like SARS-CoV, behave so differently in being able to infect the upper airway? And this is really a critical question to try to understand transmission from person to person. The second one is why does COVID-19 preferentially cause disease in people over 70 and spare children less than 10? This is exactly the same thing that actually happens in our mice. So there's something again about these viruses. We have some ideas and I'll mention that briefly in one of my slides, but this is remarkable in, in the SARS epidemic, no one who was under the age of 24 died, but if you were over 60, 50% died. And we're seeing not those kinds of numbers here, but we're seeing basically very, very few deaths in younger people. And if you're over 80, the deaths are maybe 20%. So huge difference in age again. Another key question is what are the prospects for broadly useful antiviral therapies? We hear a lot in the popular press about therapies, remdesivir and others that are useful for hospitalized patients. These are, there's several issues with these therapies so far. Many of them are for people who are already sick. Many of them require intravenous administration so they can't be given to everybody. 
And what, what I would really love to see, and I, other people too, it's not just me, is an oral drug that we can give to somebody early in the infection, like we give Tamiflu to people, and basically stops the infection. So we don't have that yet. There's a couple of possibilities. We're not really working on that, but I think that's one of the key things that we'd love to get. And finally, uh, the issue of the hour is, will vaccines work as well as we would like? Will the vaccines allow us to fully reopen the University of Iowa? And how, how will these vaccines work? What kind of immunity will they induce? Will the immunity be long lasting? Long lasting? How durable is it? We've done a lot of studies and work on other uh, common cold coronaviruses. So we suspect that actually the immunity may not be so uh, durable. We know that for people who had MERS, if you had MERS and you had it for, you were very sick, then you had good immunity. If you weren't so sick, it was more like the common cold coronavirus and it seemed to recede with time. Could I have the next slide? So just to go over briefly some of the things we've done, which have already been mentioned. So we have developed mouse models for these various viruses. And part of it is because mice are such an easy experimental animal to manipulate, but except for SARS, these viruses didn't naturally infect the virus. Uh, the virus didn't naturally infect the mice. So we had to manipulate the mice to make them infest infectable. And then we had to further manipulate them so we could get a range of diseases. A lot of the experimental animals that are being studied now for COVID-19 develop very, very mild disease. We think that we need models for more severe disease and that's what we've developed. Can I have the next slide? So the role of aging I mentioned already. And one of the things that we found is that we, we could identify a molecule of, called the prostaglandin, which seemed to increase during aging. And this molecule is one of the many molecules on a pathway that's affected by drugs like ibuprofen or aspirin. So when you take one of those drugs, you affect many different prostaglandins, but this particular one, prostaglandin D2, seemed to be most important in aging. It goes up in the lungs as people get older. And if you actually block it, uh, its activity, you get better outcomes in, at least in our experimentally infected animals. Uh, and so we're, we're thinking, we're um, interested in this uh, from a therapeutic point of view. Can I have the next slide? And so this was something we were approached by a company called BioAge. We actually approached by a couple of companies. This one was BioAge had a drug that stopped an upstream, well, one of the upstream molecules from uh, prostaglandin D2. We also have other companies that approach us about other uh, parts of the pathway. And what we know already is that if we give this drug to mice infected with SARS coronavirus, not the SARS-2, but the SARS coronavirus, we know that the mice actually survive. So this is something the company and we are very keen on getting to clinical trials, because this is uh, something that can be given uh, to patients uh, or people when they have just mild coronavirus. And it would be possible then to do the ideal situation of being to, if we can get it to a, a reasonable price and you could give it to everybody who had mild disease and particularly people who are at high risk for more severe disease, older people, people with diabetes, then this would be a really useful contribution. Could I have the next slide? And then we also have a, in addition to NIH grants, which I won't talk about, we have a small research grant from Lilly to test some of the monoclonal antibodies that are actually already in use and seem to be promising in some settings to uh, in patients with mild disease to prevent progression to more severe disease. We did some testing for ABV with some of the drugs that were early on were in, uh, considered possibly useful that were originally developed for HIV. And then we we're also working with investigators to uh, characterize and bring to market a drug that act directly inhibits the ability of the virus to grow. This drug actually is was first developed for cats who are infected with a feline coronavirus, where they, the cats all die. If you give this drug, even if the cats have severe disease, they recover. So this is, again, a really, to my mind, a promising possibility. It tends, this drug is intravenous, so it's less interesting to me than one of the oral ones that you can give to prevent uh, severe disease while patients still have mild disease. And the UI is a co-owner of a patent for this drug. Can I have the next slide? And so, uh, as Brooks mentioned, we're also interested in the loss of sense of smell. This anosmia is really curious because this is often the only symptom that people who have COVID-19 have. So they, people who have a sense of smell and come into an office and say, I can't smell anymore. Uh, it's very, very likely they have COVID-19, even if they never get a respiratory disease or anything else. 
So the, the military, it's people in the military have talked to me about this because they're trying to figure out how to handle soldiers who have anosmia and whether this is a sign of something that needs to get to put them on the, uh, uh, out of duty for a little bit of time. And so we're also working to understand the excessive inflammatory response that people who have COVID-19 develop. Uh, we're working with clinicians at the university and elsewhere around the world. We have some work with the WHO on this as well, trying to figure out how do people, uh, why do people who get severe disease have these abnormal immune response that I mentioned in the beginning? And so inhibiting the function of these cells may be useful clinically. And this is the thing that we heard about before when steroids are used, that's what they're basically doing, inhibiting this really excessive immune response. And next slide. And then finally, we're continuing to work on what was really my first project that I worked on for, still working on for the, uh, when I came to Iowa, which is a mouse model for multiple sclerosis, a disease, of course, a really debilitating a chronic disease of people uh, that often uh, leads to really great loss of function. So we were very interested in this model as well. So next slide. So with that, well, I've gone over my time. I apologize, but I'll be happy to take any questions or comments if that if there are any. Are there any questions for Dr. Perlman? Well, if not, I'd like to thank Dr. Perlin for your very informative and interesting presentation. Um, we're relying on you for, for a lot, and I think I can speak for all of us in the room and beyond uh, throughout the nation. So thank you for that. Um, we look forward, yes, we look forward to any updates that you may have in, in the future. So uh, keep, keep up the good work. Uh, thank Dr. you. Yes, you're most welcome. Are there any questions for Dr. Jackson and his team? Okay, if none, I just would like to thank them for all the work that they've done and continue to do, plus everyone at UIHC. As the state of Iowa map showed, it's not only UIHC and University of Iowa that relies on you, it's the whole state. So thank you for all of that. And with that, um, we'll let you go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Regent Bates and all the presenters, even Brad. Uh, so uh, thank you. Um, now we'll move on to the consent agenda, the regular meeting, the consent agenda. Are there items the board members would like to remove from the consent agenda for a separate vote? A motion and a second require, are required to approve and receive items on the consent agenda. Is there a motion? I'll move. Motion. Uh, Regent County? Yes. Is there a second? Second. Regent Dakovich. A motion by Regent County and a second by Regent Dakovich has been presented. Any discussion? Uh, Regent Barker. Yeah, um, one item on the consent agenda is the Hilton Coliseum expansion. Uh, we postponed approval of this project before because of uncertainty about the financial situation of university athletics. Uh, while there is still uncertainty, we're now expecting revenue from football, uh, and so the uncertainty is somewhat diminished. But our action today does not guarantee that the entire project will be approved. Today, we're approving initial planning, which will be entirely paid for by donors. At a future meeting, we will consider the entire project based on our financial situation at that time and whether the pandemic is still affecting our athletic programs. Is there any other comments or discussion on this topic? On this, on this topic or any other part of the consent agenda? Okay, thank you. Uh, we, we will have a roll call vote for approval uh, for the, for, excuse me, for the motion. Regent Least? Yes. That's a yes. Regent Dunkel? Yes. Regent Lindemeyer? Yes. Regent Barker? Yes. Regent County? Uh, yes. Regent Dakovich? Yes. 
Regent Bates? Yes. Regent Butker? Yes. Uh, Regent Richards abstains from item O and votes yes on all other items. The motion is approved. This time, I'd like to recognize uh, Brad Berg, who will uh, introduce uh, Elizabeth Bergman of uh, Baker Tilly for a report on the result of today's uh, bids. Brad. Yeah. Good afternoon, members of the board. Uh, this morning, we received bids on behalf of the University of Northern Iowa's uh, dormitory system. Uh, Elizabeth Bergman from Baker Tilly uh, is here to present the results uh, of that bid opening. Elizabeth? Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for, uh, for having me to tell you about the results of the sale for the University of Northern Iowa. Uh, they sold taxable dormitory refunding bonds, series 2020, which were refunding the uh, 2011 dormitory bonds and being sold for a uh, present value savings. And uh, it really ended up to be a very good sale and realized quite a bit of savings. So we took competitive bids this morning at 1030 and WR Baird was the winning bid with an interest rate, a true interest uh, cost of 1.69%, an exceptionally low interest cost for the bonds that go out until 2033. Um, it garnered 1.4 million, almost nearly 1.4 million in savings and more than 8% of uh, debt service, the refunded debt service it, it was savings. Um, as part of the process, the university had its ratings reviewed by Moody's Investor Service. All ratings were held and an A1 was assigned to the new bonds uh, and they cited excellent strategic positioning, uh, the benefit of oversight of the Board of Regents and projected ability to meet debt service coverage on the residence halls as the um, you know, favorable indications that allow the university to maintain its rating in this very challenging environment for higher education. So all in all, a terrific sale. Happy to answer questions, but congratulations. Are there any questions for um, Elizabeth uh, Bergman? Excuse me, I should say Ms. Bergman. Uh, or Brad. A motion and a second are required to approve a resolution providing for the sale and authorizing and providing for the issuance and securing the payment of $14,545,000 uh, dormitory revenue refunding bonds series UNI 2020 taxable for the purpose of advanced refunding the $24,870,000 dormitory revenue bonds series UNI 2011 and paying costs of issuance. Is there a motion? So move. I'll second. Regent County moved and Regent Bates seconded. Is that correct? Okay, any discussion? We'll have a roll call vote. Uh, Regent Dokovich? Yes. Regent Dunkel? Yes. Regent Least? Yes. Regent Bates? Yes. Regent Lindemeyer? Yes. Regent Butker? Yes. Regent Barker? Yes. Regent County. Yes. Regent Richards votes yes. The motion is approved. Good sale. <laughs> At this time, I'd like to have a couple of, a few comments. Uh, uh, members of the board and I want to thank 
all of those who have worked so hard to put together detailed plans for our universities and special schools to provide an on-campus instruction this fall. In the spring, we heard from many students and parents and faculty that they wanted to have the on-campus student experience. We listened and we set a goal to deliver on-campus instruction this fall. And through thoughtful and detailed planning and preparation, we have over 100,000 students, staff, faculty, and healthcare providers back on the campus learning, researching, and caring for Iowans again. As we heard in the presentation during the UIHC committee, it is this research that will lead to creating treatments, vaccines, and cures for COVID-19. While COVID-19 has been a particular focus of our board efforts, we continue with all of our other governance responsibilities. We also created an advisory group to look at ways we could stretch our resources for opportunities to increase the collaboration that already is taking place among our institutions. The advisory group has been meeting all summer with senior leaders from the campuses and is today bringing the first recommendation to the board to consider. The advisory group will continue working through the fall and we look forward to their recommendations in November. I should note in order to be as open and transparent as possible that as well as providing ample time to review the recommendations, the advisory group will present their recommendations in November, but the board will not act on the recommendations until February board meeting. In a few minutes, the board will discuss the fiscal year 2022 appropriations request. As I have said a number of times, we have a partnership between the state, the universities and students to provide high quality accessible education. We established a five year tuition plan that asked for resources from all three legs of the stool. We are keeping our word and sticking to that plan. In addition to the $18 million in new funding we are requesting, we are also asking for the prior cut of 8 million for this fiscal year to be restored. As you will hear when we discuss the advisory group recommendation, they have recommended a new, no new net square foot policy. I'll say that again, no new net square foot policy be put in place until the end of fiscal year 2022. There are uh, some exceptions to that uh, that uh, Regent Barker will discuss. We have adjusted our capital request <coughs> of the state to ask for increased deferred maintenance funding to improve our care of some of the facilities we currently have. Finally, I do, not, I do want to acknowledge that since March, many tough decisions have had to be made. Not everyone will agree with every decision that has been made, nor will they agree with all the tough decisions that are yet to come. I urge all of us to remember that universities are a place where different viewpoints can be voiced freely and openly but in a respectful and peaceful manner. At this time, I'd like to uh, recognize uh, Brad Berg uh, one more, uh, once again, who will make some introductory, uh, in introductory comments and introduce the athletic directors who will speak. Brad. Thank you, President Richards. Uh, before the board today are the proposed athletic budgets that were assembled amidst uh, an, ever, an ever changing environment, uh, given the impact the pandemic has had and will continue to have on the sports schedules and on attendance levels. With that said, I'd like to welcome the university athletic directors uh, who will present their budgets to the board. 
Uh, first, I'd like to recognize Mr. David Harris from the University of Northern Iowa. David, I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for uh, the opportunity to be able to provide a, a brief update uh, on our budget. Uh, I think I can speak on behalf of, of uh, Jamie and, and Gary in saying that this has been a tremendously challenging process, uh, not just because of the decisions that uh, ultimately have to be made, but just uh, based on the, the course that things have taken over the past few months uh, and things that are uh, likely to happen over the next couple of months, uh, that there continues to be a lot of uncertainty uh, about where things are going to land. And while we uh, are now getting more information uh, about where things are going to be from a scheduling standpoint, uh, there's still a chance that things won't come across or won't uh, go off exactly as we planned. And in a year like this, that has a significant uh, budget impact. Uh, but having said that, uh, our budget for this year uh, is $12.7 million. Uh, that is down from approximately 14.4 million uh, last year, which for us uh, represents a reduction of about 12% or roughly $1.7 million uh, in our overall budget. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about our, our revenue uh, highlights uh, talk some about our expenses, uh, talk a little bit about uh, revenue enhancements uh, that we have uh, in place for this year, uh, and then ultimately open it up for questions. Uh, from a revenue standpoint, uh, typically our budget is comprised of, uh, I guess you can say that 55% uh, of our budget is typically self-generated. 45% uh, roughly is provided by support uh, from the university. Uh, when you look at those numbers, uh, that has actually changed quite significantly over the last 10 or 12 years uh, when the budget was 65% from university support and 35% uh, self-generated. So there's certainly been progress that has been made there over the last decade. Uh, if you look at how the department is funded, uh, in that 55%, you have about 16% uh, from foundation support or private donations, 10% uh, uh, from ticket sales, 10% uh, from the NCAA and conference uh, distributions, uh, about 8% from our multimedia rights partnership, uh, and then 11% from, from other areas. Uh, if you look at the 45% uh, that is ultimately from the university, uh, then that is comprised of uh, money that comes to us from the general education fund as well as from student fees. So as we went into this year and put together the budget, uh, there are several revenue areas that were impacted uh, for us, uh, starting with our NCA distributions, uh, which were down about 680,000. Uh, that represents a 47% uh, decrease in that particular area for us. Uh, our football away game guarantee uh, is down $650,000 uh, this year. Uh, our ticket sales uh, are projected to be down about $800,000 uh, and then concessions uh, about $160,000. Uh, if you look at our ticket sales, that's about a 47% uh, decrease as well based on where things stand. Uh, and then our support from the foundation uh, is right around 120,000 uh, down from where it would normally be. Uh, and then in campus support with the general education fund uh, being down by about 200,000 uh, and then student fees about 115,000. So overall, if you look at our revenue, uh, we were down about 2.7 million uh, as we worked to put together uh, and submit the budget. Uh, from an expense standpoint, I, in most years, if you look at how our expenses come together, uh, it's about 45% or so personnel, uh, then another 30% or so with scholarships, uh, then about 15% with our team operating budgets, our administrative op operating budgets as well, uh, and then another 10% from a variety of sources. 
So as we looked at our expenses, we obviously had to think about with that amount of revenue missing from our FY21 budget, how could we make corresponding de decreases in our expenses to try to get into a balanced situation? Uh, many of you likely saw that we uh, did some things from a personnel standpoint with our salaries uh, in that all of our staff members who are above 41,000 uh, in annual salary took between a five and 12 and a half percent uh, one year decrease in their, their salary. Uh, so that along with leaving uh, several positions open and also laying off positions uh, took us to about a $740,000 uh, savings for the department for this year. Uh, also, if you look at our operating budgets, uh, we were able to reduce those by about 600,000, which represents a 34% uh, decrease in our operating budgets. When you look at our personnel budgets, uh, that decreases about 11%. Uh, and then we also decreased our administrative operating budgets by about 100,000 or about 16%, uh, officiating budgets by about 26%. Uh, and then we suspended uh, all of our contract incentives uh, for myself as well as all of our coaches. Uh, in any given year, those numbers end up being different uh, depending on the success of our programs. But if you look at a five-year average, uh, typically, we are paying about one hundred and forty to one hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars in incentives as a department. So uh, that's a savings that we will have for this year. So as you transition out of expenses and looking at revenue enhancements, uh, there are a couple of things that we did this year to try to also make up the gap. Uh, one of which is that we received one time funding from the NCA distribution uh, a few years ago that we had not spent in its entirety. Uh, so we had that available to us, uh, as well as some additional income uh, that came from named scholarships that put us uh, in the neighborhood of an additional $500,000 uh, of revenue coming to the department. Uh, but then finally, just last week, uh, we announced what's called the UNI Fight Initiative, uh, which is a request on behalf of the department uh, to our fans and our supporters and our donors. Uh, to make donations above and beyond what they normally would give to the university through uh, scholarships, the Panther Scholarship Club, uh, uh, salary support, or however they would normally give. Uh, we've asked them to make donations uh, to the department to help us uh, with operating expenses on a one-year basis uh, to be able to close the gap between our revenue and our expenses. Uh, we went through a, about a, a six-week time period uh, where we were in the quiet phase of that campaign. And then we announced it uh, publicly just last Wednesday. Uh, to this point, we have pledges right about at $400,000 uh, from our fans stepping up and, and helping us in that regard. So through the revenue enhancements, uh, that has helped us not have to cut quite as much out of our expenses. But as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, all of this is at one point in time. Uh, these things, if you look at our ticket sales and our concessions, those things are contingent on having fans at our games, uh, but also uh, adhering to the governor's proclamation about six feet of distancing uh, being necessary at those games. And so it will put our capacity somewhere between 15 and 20 percent uh, if we are able to have fans at those games. If we're not able to have fans, uh, then obviously that will have uh, uh, an impact on our budget that we will have to uh, adjust for and adjust to. Uh, with that, I want to stop and, and open it up to, to any questions that anybody would, would have about our budget. Questions for David? If not, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, and we'll now proceed with Gary Barta from the University of Iowa. Gary. You're muted, Gary. You'd think by now. Um, 
I, I just want to echo what, uh, what David said. I think he set the table well for what he's going through, what uh, Jamie's going through, and really what college athletics is going through across the country. And I say that in athletics, it's obviously much bigger than that with uh, what our country, what our state, and what our universities are going through. Uh, we were at Iowa, we were riding a, a, a great wave of momentum competitively and, and financially. We, we have been uh, self-sustaining since 2007 and we were giving money back to the university um, and, and President Harold and I had worked that, that out. On March 12th, that all changed. March 12th is the date that we were at the Big Ten tournament in Indianapolis. And, uh, and that tournament was canceled. And then within a day, the NCAA men's basketball, wrestling, women's basketball championships were canceled. And then another day and all NCAA championships through the spring were canceled. And, uh, you know, since then, David, you said it perfectly, uh, uncertainty, financial stress, uncertainty with the pandemic, which we still face. We still face the uncertainty with the, with the virus, the disease, and, and, uh, and with our finances. The budget, I'm gonna go about this slightly differently because my circumstances are a little bit different than, than David's, but the budget that we presented to the board, at the time we presented it, uh, the Big 10 had made a decision to not play any football games. And so the budget you have before you is a reflection of that. And the day that August 11th occurred, that's the day the Big 10 made the decision to not play football. Uh, that day, our, the bottom dropped out of our revenue. And, and compared to last year, we were projecting uh, a budget of $100 million less in revenue. And even after several cuts, and I'll share those with you uh, in, in a moment, uh, we were still looking at a $75 million deficit. And I was working with uh, President Harold and Terry Johnson on, uh, on covering how we would cover that. Now, since that day, since we submitted this budget to the regents on September 16th, uh, the announcement was made that we are going to bring back and play up to nine games uh, beginning October 23rd and, and 24th. Without question, that will reduce our deficit. Um, there, however, the financial issues that we're facing are still significant and, uh, and the deficit will still be very large. Some of the factors that I don't yet, uh, there are some factors I, I have access to. So the games that are going to be played, if we're able to play them, and I say that because uh, every week there are games being postponed or canceled due, due to the pandemic. Uh, just yesterday, Notre Dame canceled its game with Wake Forest. But, but assuming we get to play these games, we're going to play them without fans. And what that means in our budget annually in football, we receive uh, more than $20 million a year in ticket revenue. And so we'll be without that. Associated with that ticket revenue, we receive between 15 and $20 million in premium seating, either through the suites, the club seats, or seat donations, and, and we'll be without that. We will receive uh, an increase from what we had been budgeted with no football. We'll receive an increase from that. That has still not been determined how much that will be. And so we'll, we'll, we'll be, we're in negotiations there. The other issue uh, from an expense standpoint, we've, uh, we've established a very rigid uh, medical protocol, rightly so. And that's gonna have a significant cost to it in testing, everyday testing and a cardiac uh, protocol that's, that's gonna be uh, expensive for anybody who tests positive. So I'll provide to this group uh, should you be uh, should you be interested, I can provide to this group later, maybe as late as December when we've played some of these games, or earlier if we get more certainty on the revenue we're going to receive from football. Uh, I'll provide that to the board. Certainly, um, I know that we I know that our deficit will not be seventy six million dollars, uh, but it will be tens of millions, not ten, not twenty, thirty. It will be you know, maybe 40 to $60 million. I know that's a wide range and I'm doing that intentionally because until I know the television revenue minus the, uh, the medical expense, uh, that's what will, will provide me better direction. So I definitely will bring that back to the group. I just wanna give you a little bit more background uh, and context to our budget, as well as the timeline we went through this summer and then I'll answer any questions. We have been in a self-sustaining mode uh, since 2007, as I mentioned. Um, in March through June, so after the tournament was canceled, we knew 
quickly, we were going to lose our revenue from the Big Ten basketball tournament and the NCAA tournament. We curbed expenses at that time to finish the, the fiscal year, but we ended up with a $3.6 million deficit. And we covered that deficit with athletic department reserves. So last year's books were closed. It was at that time from April, May, and June, we began creating three, we, we created several scenarios, uh, trying to guesstimate it through the uncertainty what, what our year might look like fiscally. Uh, but we created a phase one, phase two, phase three uh, uh, discussion point. Phase one was playing 12 football games with less fans and playing a full men's basketball season. We worked on that immediately because that was the mode we were in. And we knew that we would have to reduce our, our expenses because our, we knew our revenue would be decreased. And so we found through pay cuts um, and operational budget cuts and a reworking of some short-term debt, we found $15 million in cuts heading into the new fiscal year. That was phase one. We then began, we, we communicated through all staff meetings and head coaches meetings every month. And I gave our staff and our coaches updates on our fiscal situation. Sometime in, in June or July, we began to, we shared with them in May that if we hit phase three, if football isn't played, we, we told them there would be position cuts, there would be more uh, compensation dis, uh, reductions. And going back to May, we started to talk about the possibility of having to eliminate some sports. And we, and we gave them updates every month. Then on August 11th, uh, the day that it was announced that we weren't gonna play football, I can tell you that that was an emotional moment for our department, for everybody involved, because we knew that day that we had hit phase three. And so that day, uh, we had several staff members who reached out to us. We had already, um, we had to start meeting with them to talk about uh, reducing positions, uh, some we didn't fill and, and several that we, we had to eliminate. We, we, we had to take in addition to the pay cuts we had already eliminated or we had already implemented, we had to then add to that furlough days and, and we're still going through that through the end of this year. And then finally, that was the day where we realized that cutting sports was, was going to have to occur. And, and we had been planning we had had conversations uh, on our campus about what, what if phase three, what are the different options? What are the, what are the positions we might cut? What are, the, what are the furloughs or unpaid leave and what sports might we consider? And we looked at several different options. As you know, we ended up uh, coming down to four sports that, that we ended up, um, that we will discontinue at the end of this year. September 16th, I'm almost done. September 16th was good news if you're a football student athlete or coach, uh, it was good news for those uh, staff members that were still working here and, and because it, it lifted the energy, knowing that we could play football. And it was certainly good news to Hawkeye fans who wanted to, to play. However, uh, the great news didn't fix the problem. And so that day I had staff members whose positions were being eliminated contact us and ask if they'd be able to stay on. And we had to have that very, very challenging discussion to say, no, I'm sorry, but this, this hole is still very deep and it's gonna be impacting us probably more than a decade as we pay back uh, the deficit. And so no, the positions are still gone. The, the pay cuts are still in place and the furloughs uh, are still having to be taken. And the other thing that uh, happened to uh, occurred immediately is the, the supporters of those four sports, whether it's current students, coaches, alumni came back to us and said, now that you're playing football, will you, will you be able to bring back these sports? And uh, immediately we had to share with them, no, the decision's final. And it's final only because the deficit is still very, very significant. As I shared earlier, we anticipate it will still be somewhere between 40 and $60 million. As recently as yesterday, some of the support group for those sports you know, indicated, you know, was still trying to find a way to see if they could bring it back. And they, they raised, uh, you know, admirably, they raised, they, they indicated they've raised $1.7 million. But we've been clear with them that it would take 20 or 30 times that, maybe more, to bring those sports back. Because that is the, I think sometimes we hear these numbers and we throw them around and we don't, we don't really rest on how significant, if we, if we face a $50 million deficit this year, it will take us over a decade to pay that back. 
And, and it just, it isn't possible to bring these sports back or to, or to take these positions and bring them all back right away or, or to eliminate the pay cuts that we had to implement uh, because this, this, uh, this is gonna be with us for quite some time. Now, I, I will tell you, we do have a plan to remain self-sustaining and pay that deficit back so that we don't create a burden on our campus because clearly our campus is going through similar challenges. So our next steps, we'll continue to keep expenses down. We'll learn our net uh, increase or, or decrease of the deficit increase of our revenue between now and December. I'll continue to work with President Harold and Terry Johnson on, on how we're going to manage and cover that deficit and pay it back. And all the while, those student athletes uh, are still gonna have a, a great training experience safe in this environment. And for those that get to because COVID allows uh, competition and, and continue to provide them a great academic experience. So again, slightly different than the way David presented, but I thought it would be helpful to give you a timeline of how we went through this. And I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. Uh, Gary, this is Jim Lindenmeyer. Uh, I had a question for you, or, or maybe President Harold would answer this, but are you responsible, is the athletic department responsible for the swimming facility, or is that an institutional responsibility, and what's your plan, I guess, to do, what, what are you going to do with that? Well, the, my, my answer, and President Harold can chime in, uh, we, we have a, a great relationship on many of our facilities with rec services, um, and, and athletics. And this is one of several where we, we built it together financially and, and we share in the expense. Uh, we had another facility that now hosts our indoor track that used to be funded entirely by the university. Uh, and then we took that over. And so now we fund it in its entirety, all its operating costs, et cetera. So I, I'll work, I'm working with Terry Johnson on a similar kind of phase back the other direction where the facility, our portion of the facility, uh, the, the swimming pool in particular, uh, was paid off long ago, but the operational cost, we'll phase that out and work with uh, Terry Johnson on how that'll work. But it'll work in reverse of what we did in the other rec building when we took over the building and rec services moved out. Thank so you. So Regent Lindemeyer, this is Bruce. It, it, it'll return to the university and ironically, it will then become more of a community uh, opportunity than it will be for athletics because our swimming team occupies so much of that pool time today uh, for their own practices and meets. And so um, we'll pick it up all on the university side, which we have a budget for as well. And we'll have a negotiation between athletics and ourselves about that transition. But that, that'll be what happens. Thank you. Gary, this is uh, Nancy Butker. Um, I certainly appreciate the difficult decisions that you all have had to make over the last months and uh, the huge challenges involved. Many of us on the Board of Regents are receiving a lot of um, email and correspondence from alumni that uh, feel like they maybe should have been um, involved more before the sports were dropped. I just one was wondering how in the process, would it have been appropriate to reach out to alumni or, or, or not? I mean, the letters are all very similar. Um, and I don't know much about national organizations if they are um, involved in this, but could you just kind of clarify a little bit in that decision-making process? Yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. I, I certainly, uh, it, in going through this process, the financial challenge is so deep and, yeah. and so great that uh, really conversations about pulling out of it, um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, the community having, when we built the pool, um, it was a $9 million investment by athletics. And we put on a two-year campaign to raise money for that. And the swimming community contributed $400,000, which was terrific. But it was, you know, a, there was still a significant portion that, that needed to be funded by athletics. And as I mentioned, to endow uh, all these programs, it's over $100 million. And so I just knew, we knew collectively that there, it just wasn't feasible to go out and, and raise that money. And so 
I, I consulted uh, with other athletic directors around the country. Uh, I've watched colleagues of mine over the last 30 years who have had to make these tough decisions. Uh, and, and in those consultations, it, what happens if you create um, if you create a dialogue, you also run the risk of creating a false sense of hope. And, and when, you, when you make the cut, if you bring it back or if you create this environment of saying you can try to raise it uh, and it's just not realistic, um, it, it just prolongs and makes it an even more difficult transition. So right, wrong, or indifferent, um, I, I, I believe that this was the right way to go. And it's unfortunately, it's just so, it's so emotional um, and it's so difficult. One of the things we did make the decision to do, Nancy, is uh, we have guaranteed every student athlete who are in those programs, if they decide to stay at Iowa, uh, we will honor their scholarship. If they're a freshman, we'll honor their scholarship all the way to graduation. That was really an important decision that we made. We also made the decision that they can train and compete at Iowa this, this entire year. And then finally, uh, and there are some doing this that are transferring and we're helping them in, in that transfer decision. We also have had anecdotally, a few of our athletes who are looking into competing for other sports teams on our campus. So uh, we're doing everything we can to make a really difficult decision as, as uh, smooth as possible. And, and again, Gary, um, Regent Butker there, we, we purposely decided to make this announcement now rather than the end of all these seasons uh, in particular seasons and then have the basically have our student athletes competing with the rest of the, the marketplace for transfers to other institutions. We thought the more time we gave them, the better that off they would be and the fairest mm -hmm. way to deal with it. You're going to have, in my opinion, and since we've made this announcement, I've lost track, but there've been three or four, at least other institutions that have cut other sports. In my opinion, you're going to have a number of institutions doing something like this as we get further into the winter. And, and I think the only fair thing to do was to get it up front. The, the final thing I would say is, Gary and I've met with a number of the people that you're getting letters from uh, face to face. And I responded to one of them last night saying, look, we're not gonna put the university at risk. If you, what they're asking us to do is to reinstate the sports so they can run a campaign to raise the money. I'm sorry, I've been there so many times on other facilities and other activities on campus that if you do this, we'll raise the money and then we end up with 10% of what we need. And now we're on the hook to, to fund the rest of it. We don't have those sort of monies anymore. So if they wanna help us, uh, these sports are closed. And, but if we can raise an, an appropriate amount of money, which is a fairly large sum of money, uh, tens of millions of dollars, then, then we'll talk about whether we wanna reinstate them. But it has to be in that order. Otherwise, we're just putting the entire regential system at risk. I appreciate that. I think we all really appreciate your dedicated commitment to the students that are here on scholarships and that follow up. So thank you. Regent County, if you it looks like you're trying to talk. If you are talking to us, you're on mute. I apologize. <laughs> Are there any other questions for Mr. Barta? I, I just had a question since we're waiting for uh, Regent County to come back. Are you doing anything special to the field? Uh, because playing in December is gonna be kind of tough on players. Yeah, uh, doing anything special other than covering it you know, one of the things in this part of the country that you can do is you can cover the field in between games. And, uh, you know, we don't have heated coils underneath because uh, this hopefully will be the only year we'd ever have to worry about it, but we will have the opportunity to cover it and uh, have, it, have it very comfortably playable on game day. Thanks, and thanks for keeping the players safe too. I appreciate that, as we all do. You bet. Uh, Gary, it's Patty again. Can you hear Hi, me? Patty. I can now, yeah. All right. Um, you, you said earlier that you had discussed with uh, people on, or some on campus about the decisions you were making. 
um, how did you how did you handle that? And um, did you do a visit with a lot of people or a certain kind of people to uh, uh, deal with? Um, I, I'm going to before I finish here. I'm going to also tell you that I have never had as many people talk to me about the uh, being a regent and why we allowed this to happen um, in the you know almost six years I've been on. So it's I, I'm sure you're aware of the fact that it's it's. Uh, very strong feelings out there. But anyway, I was just interested mostly um, about who you visited with on campus. Yeah, I, so we began internally in the athletic department. We started there and we created that phase one, phase two, phase three, as we were, this is way back in April, where we were just trying to, trying to anticipate what our financial situation would look like depending on the levels of having the opportunity to play football. Phase one and two were a little bit less, well, they were less dire. Uh, phase three was if we, if we got hit with this, not being able to play football or not having any fans. And so I started with that. Um, internally within the athletic department, we created those spreadsheets. I then was in conversations with Terry Johnson um, uh, on campus and making sure that you know, those numbers uh, made some sense. I had conversations with President Harold uh, and then at some point, uh, you know, also wanted to give some of the regents a heads up about uh, just the, the financial levels, the phase one, the phase two, the phase three, um, and, and just making sure I was sharing openly that we, we potentially could have a huge deficit if we don't play football. And that was, the, that was the theme that I was sharing and that this deficit is going to be significant. So those are the, those are the conversations that we had uh, kind of up up the, the chain. Okay, well, I know it was probably a really difficult decision for you, but man, there's a lot of anger out there about it. Yeah, I, 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 I fully understand that. Um, I, I knew that there would be, because if you think about it, uh, I think there are about a thousand former swimmers that, that have uh, come and gone through the University of Iowa and, and great passion in that, in that constituent constituency, but um, again, the alternatives, uh, there, ju there just aren't alternatives. And if, and if I would have cut other sports, we'd be having the same discussions with a different group. I, I did go through a process, um, you know, we created a, a, a scenario and looked at several different sports, but this was the, this was the grouping that gave us the best path forward. And, and there was no good answer. I can appreciate that. I would also say, that, gee, those swimmers, they really got themselves organized and got a bunch of uh, information and sent it to all of us. They are, they are very sad about it. I'm sure you're aware of that. Yes, very aware. And, <laughs> and we have had conversations with previous swimmers, current swimmers, um, and, and trying to answer. One of the things we're trying to do is every time there is a question that comes up, we're trying to answer it. But I understand if, if, if the answer that someone is looking for is just don't cut my sport and I don't have that answer, I understand there's no way I'm gonna be able to satisfy uh, yeah. that, that question. I know that, Scott, you, you're in a bad place with, with this. That's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. So I hope you get the money someplace. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Patty, I just, I, yeah, we do too, but that's not gonna happen. Yeah, I know. <laughs> honest, I, I, I tell you what, I'd, I'd love for a regent to make a motion to fund this. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mr. President. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and any other questions for Gary? Hearing none, we'll move on to Mr. Jamie Pollard from Iowa State. Jamie? Well, thank you for uh, having me today. If I'm smiling, it's not over the topic. It's uh, my uh, office is in the north end zone of Jack Price Stadium, and we've been um, in the middle of construction all summer. And if you want them to work, all you have to do is take your mute button off because they've been really silent for the last 10 or 15 minutes. And all of a sudden, you can probably hear that little rattle drill. So forgive me. Um, I'll preface the, just my comments by um, echoing what both David and Gary said is, you know, it's certainly been very challenging and 
you know, the, as you all know from your lives, the target continues to move, not weekly, almost daily. Um, you know, the budget that we've submitted to you that you have before you, um, as bleak as that information looks, um, I, I'm here to share some confidence with you that I feel under Dr. Winterstein's uh, leadership and our department that at least we've stabilized it to a way that I feel pretty confident about what I'm going to share with you. Um, unfortunately for us, our budget is funded 50% from fans coming to our events and 50% from being a member of the Big 12 Conference. And, you know, in these times, we've, in, we've continued to incur almost all of the costs by uh, providing our student athletes a safe opportunity to go to school and to continue to be able to practice and hopefully compete. And so the budget before you reflects about 85% of a normal operating year. So it's gone down from 90 million to roughly 78 million. But unfortunately, the other side of that coin, which funds all that has gone down by over 50%. And so our revenue right now is projected at around 43 million which puts us in a budget that we've submitted of a $35 million deficit. When we get under the hood and just look at that revenue uh, at a high level, um, the budget shows that, you know, at this point in time, our ticket sales are reflected as zero, which uh, similar to Iowa is roughly about $20 million a year. Um, in addition, we have about $17 million of annual fundraising that is tied to people's tickets or to their suites or to their club seats. So that's another 17 million um, of which we are right now projecting around two and a half million. So we've lost a big chunk of that auxiliary revenue that comes from people just coming to events. Um, and then on the conference side, we would normally receive north of $40 million on an annual basis. And right now we're projecting that to be about 30 million. Um, but just to put it into a, a per game basis for you, Anytime you see a big 12 football team not answer the bell, and we've had three already, TCU, Oklahoma State, and Baylor, um, that's roughly about $4 million every time one of those teams can't answer the bell for, um, from television revenue. So, you know, our budget, again, when I say it can change daily, you know, hopefully everybody plays this weekend. But if any of us can't answer the bell, then, you know, that's a hit to the budget. And, so that budget is reflected upon hopefully everybody getting through the remainder of the season, but odds are, you know, that probably won't be the case. Um, on the expenditure side, you know, we did do a 10% across the board um, pay reduction. We also eliminated all bonuses from all contracts. Um, and then we took a 20% um, cut on all operating costs. But on the other side, we're expecting that we're gonna incur about $2 million in just testing costs. Um, to be able to meet the, you know, the health and safety standards um, that we've put in place in the conference. So what does all that mean? Well, you know, the good news is we don't have a short-term cash flow problem. You know, between the resources that the athletic department has and resources that the university can temporarily allocate to us, you know, we have the ability to um, to be able to work our way through this because the $35 million projected deficit for the year is based on an annualized budget. So that deficit isn't tomorrow morning, it's not next month. You know, it's based on a projection of what will happen through this fiscal year. So why I share that with you is we're in a good cash position in the short term and allows us to be able to um, really watch what's happening and make decisions appropriately. As we think about the you know, upside of what could happen. Um, you know, we will most likely be making a decision about fans in the stands later this week. And, um, you know, that could help us be able to mitigate some of that 35 million, both in ticket sales, but also in those donations that people make that are tied to those seat locations. Secondly, um, you know, when we think about the go forward plan, you know, in a worst case scenario, in a worst case scenario, if we had to um, pay back the $35 million over a normal bonding uh, cycle, that would be roughly about $2.6 million a year in annual debt service. And we feel pretty comfortable today that we have plans of various options on how to approach that, both through a combination of either additional payroll cuts, additional operating costs, 
or a combination of the two. Um, but as I said, I think that's our worst case scenario. I think we're gonna be able to shrink that $35 million down some. And um, I don't think we're gonna need to tap into university resources for, the, for that full amount based on some of the cash resources that the athletic department has available at this time. So I share that because I do feel that we're in a, a fairly good position at this point in time to weather both the storm through this year and have a good plan of how to come out it on the other side. But, um, you know, again, that's contingent upon us being able to you know, continue to play football through this fall and hopefully be able to play basketball um, through the winter. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over uh, to all of you if there's any questions. Jamie, this is Jim Lindenmeyer. I, I'm asking this just out of curiosity and it's, it's hard to uh, think past this circumstance I think that we're in, but, uh, and this is really for all three of you or any of the three of you, but was there any anticipation ahead of COVID that there was going to be a cost, a budgetary cost because of the name likeness uh, image uh, circumstance? And of course that'll be there when we come out of this, but will that also affect budgets? Well, um, I think I can speak for all three of us, but they, we can all jump in is, um, we all know that that's like another thing waiting. Yeah. Um, you know, but at the same time, most of us have been, you know, in triage trying to figure out how to get to what's waiting for us. So uh, yes, I think all of us are gonna be facing that. Um, and those that, you know, have said, well, it's an external cost, you know, it's not gonna come out of your budget. You know, life is full of, decisions and then consequences of those decisions. And, you know, it's yet to see how that'll all play out, but I think it's wise for all of us to anticipate that there will be a hit to each of us financially for that. Um, because it, there's not unlimited monies out there. Those funds will get reallocated by those that sponsors or others that may choose to put their money into the name, image and likeness. So, Jamie, and this is probably for all of you, this is Sherry Bates. I just had a question, you know, first of all, thank you for all of you that what you're doing with the testing and Nancy had spoken to that and keeping our, our um, athletes safe. You know, is that, that's something that has to be hard to project cost wise for how long that this will go on. Um, is this a big part of your expenses and do you foresee having enough testing down the road? Have you looked into that? On that one, I can only speak for Iowa State because I think all three institutions are have different testing protocols based on their conferences. You know, one of the advantages that we've had at Iowa State, and, and I need to you know thank Dr. Winterstein for this, is we've been able to use the veterinary college and the VDL that's been able to um, not only do it efficiently for us and turn it around in 24 hours, but um, they've been able to do it in a way that's been fairly cost effective for us. So, um, you know, I'm thankful for that. We, we, as I indicated earlier, had built into our budget $2 million. Um, I, I really believe we'll, we can come in far under that, especially as testing continues to improve and there may be other ways to uh, do it more efficiently. Um, you know, so, but we, we tried to be very conservative and just took, well, what are we doing so far with football, volleyball, and soccer, and projected that over the entire year. And it, you know, it adds up really quick, but um, from an access standpoint, I feel really good at least at Iowa State because of what we have through the veterinary college. Great, great. I don't know, if I, I'll, I'll chime in, if, if in part to thank our hospital, we, you know, early on when the pandemic hit, we all knew that testing availability and, and reliability was a, was a big concern. And fortunately, uh, the, the hospital has been unbelievable. In uh, one, the, the availability has freed up a lot across the country and certainly in Iowa and Johnson County, but uh, they've been great in providing us access for our student athletes. And uh, we, we've spent, we had spent over a quarter of a million dollars as of about uh, three weeks ago. And our new program is going to be much more expensive because uh, we're working through the Big Ten 
where we'll be testing every day um, with a certain type of test, with an antigen test, and then uh, following that up with a PCR test. So, you know, like Jamie, it, it's going to be extreme, but, um, you know, it was the right thing to do to ensure uh, the safety. If we're going to play sports, let's, we, we have to make sure that there's so much unknown about this disease that we make sure that we're, we're doing it safely. Thank you. I'll just say at, at UNI, we have a partnership with uh, Mercy One, uh, who has been providing the, the testing for us. Uh, and they're typically able to turn the results around in, in 24 hours so that we can um, make sure that we're keeping our student athletes and staff members safe. And we're using uh, Dr. Brian Hainline and the standards that come forward from the NCA as far as what we have to do to have the appropriate testing in place depending on the sport because uh, the sports are classified differently from high, moderate to low risk and the requirements uh, to test our student athletes in the inner bubble are different depending on uh, where your sport falls. But uh, we're using that as our guide uh, to make sure that our student athletes get tested regularly. Uh, and uh, Mercy One has been great about helping us uh, get those results and, and uh, communicate as necessary. Thank you. I think everybody thanks you keeping the kids safe. Any other questions? Well, hearing none, I wanna thank the athletic directors for joining us today to discuss uh, a most difficult budget year. So, so thank you. And with that, President Richards, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank each one of the athletic directors. Uh, uh, very tough decisions. Um, uh, sir, I believe I should make a, just a brief comment. And I know that President Harold was sort of joking about the regents, uh, but the regents are, the, there's a so-called Knight Commission from I believe 1994 of which we are, sig or 96 or something, we're signatories and that is uh, the uh, uh, presidents of the university uh, determine uh, what sports are played at their university. And we do not uh, actually, by that agreement, we do not specifically budget for any particular sport. I just wanted to bring that out. Um, and I know, I, I understand the, the, the way it was delivered, but I, it, it is a, would be a public question, but I'm just, just me mentioning that. Um, no, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, tough, tough time. Advisory group, um, I'd like to uh, at this time recognize uh, Regent Barker will make uh, comments about the proposed uh, recommendation that we have before us. Thank you. Thank you, President Richards. Um, well, I wanna thank uh, the uh, co-chair of the group, uh, Regent Dunkel, uh, and also uh, members, uh, Regent Lindenmeyer and uh, Regent Butker. Uh, they put in many hours on Zoom uh, and uh, reading reports and considering a wide variety uh, of issues. Uh, we are making one recommendation uh, today and there will be others to come. Uh, I also wanna thank uh, Mark Braun and Rachel Boone. Uh, without uh, their help, uh, this would have been a, a much more difficult uh, job. They, their, their support uh, was uh, crucial uh, to our efforts. I also wanna thank many people at the University of Iowa, Iowa State and UNI, uh, the provosts and administrators who uh, helped us uh, uh, understand uh, uh, many programs and special thanks to uh, President Harold, uh, uh, President Winterstein, and President Nook uh, for some uh, frank and constructive discussion. Um, even before the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, this board was concerned about demographic projections showing a possible decline in the college age population over the next 10 years. We were also interested in whether online course delivery might affect our enrollments and our need for physical space. Uh, we discussed this at, at some length uh, a year ago. 
the pandemic, though, greatly accelerated these concerns. We suddenly switched to entirely online delivery in the spring and summer and are now offering a combination of in-person, hybrid, and, and online courses. It is difficult to accurately predict anything in such a dynamic environment. We don't know to what extent these shifts in delivery methods are permanent, but it is possible that our need for square footage in buildings will diminish. Until we have a better idea of where the market for higher education is heading, the advisory group recommends that we not add additional physical building space at our three universities. No new net square footage. This recommended moratorium has exceptions for projects that are currently underway, that deliver health care, and that are fully funded by philanthropic support. That's important. Let me uh, repeat that our moratorium will not affect projects underway, UIHC projects, or projects funded entirely by philanthropic support. Until we have a better understanding of our future needs, we need to be judicious and cautious, and for now, not put resources into brick and mortar when our precious resources may need be needed in other areas. Since we will not be constructing new buildings, making efficient use of existing space and maintaining existing buildings will become even more important than usual, and we urge administrators to plan accordingly. We have 840 buildings containing 42 million square feet with an average age of 42 years. Replacing them would cost $21 billion, which of course we do not have. It is urgent that we address deferred maintenance in these buildings so that they can be kept in service as long as possible. Maintenance is expensive and it isn't glamorous, but it is economical in the long run. The recommended moratorium would take effect immediately and would be in effect until June 30th of 2022, unless the moratorium is extended by the board. Thank you. Is there discussion? President um, Richards? Yes. I just also Regent like to e echo all the thank yous that um, Regent Barker just went through and um, Today's moratorium that's being presented is based on facts and continued efficiency on our campuses. And so I fully support the, the moratorium too. Any other discussion? Uh, Mike, it's Patty. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I just, thank you. I just think um, it is thoughtful, uh, wise, and uh, uh, there's probably going to be some people that don't like it, but I think it's a really good thing to do. Um, I applaud all of you who are connected with it. Thank you. Regent Parker, any other comments? Okay. Um, a regent, uh, excuse me, a motion and a second are required to approve the recommendation as outlined in the agenda item. Is there a motion? So moved. So, regent Barker. Moves. I'll second it. Regent Dunkel seconds. Any discussion? We'll have a roll call vote. Regent Barker? Yes. Regent Bates? Yes. Regent Butker? Yes. Regent County? Yes. Regent Dokovich? Yes. Regent Dunkel? Yes. Regent Least. Yes. Regent Lindemeyer. Yes. Regent Richards votes yes. The motion is approved. Uh, now, a uh, piece of housekeeping, please. Um, the After we got the news about the athletic budgets, uh, I forgot uh, one very important thing. Uh, 
we need to approve the athletic budgets. Ah. So I'm going to uh, step back uh, and handle that. A, mo uh, a motion and a second are re required to approve the budgets as outlined in the agenda item. Is there a motion or any other discussion be because of the irregular motion? Moving. Is there a motion to approve the athletic department budgets? This is so shared. Moved. I'll second. So it was, uh, who moved for the, was that? Jim, Jim, Jim Lindenmeyer. Uh, oh, Regent Lindenmeyer and Regent Bates seconded. Any discussion? Further discussion? Regent ba uh, Barker. Yes. Regent Bates. Yes. Regent Butker. Yes. Regent County. Yes. Regent Dokovich. Yes. Regent Dunkel. Yes. Regent Least. Yes. Regent Lindemeyer. Yes. Regent Richards votes yes. The athletic budgets are approved. Okay. Now, having done that, I'd like to. Uh, Recognize one more time uh, uh, Brad Berg from the Regents Office who will discuss the state appropriation request. Thank you, Mr. President. As you mentioned in your report for the board's consideration today is the operating and other appropriations request for FY 2022 that totals 642.9 million is provided in the docket. Um, the, re the request includes an incremental 18 million for the general university lines and operational increases for the special schools. Also included in the request is the restoration of the $8 million cut uh, realized for the current year that was allocated across the university appropriated units. With that, I would be happy to respond to any questions you may have. Are there questions about the uh budget for Mr. Berg. Hearing none, I'll proceed with the motion. A motion and a second are required to approve the operating appropriations request for fiscal year 2022 as outlined in the docket item and to authorize actions by designated region staff to seek uh, collaboration and partnerships between uh, regents, institutions, and other sectors of state government. Is there a motion? Motion. Second. Okay, that was Regent Bunker. Who was first? I'm sorry. Dokovich. Yeah. okay. A region Doc a motion by Regent Dokovich and a second by Regent Bunker. Any discussion? We'll have a roll call vote. Regent Bates? Yes. Regent Barker? Yes. Regent Dokovich? Yes. Regent County? Yes. Regent Least? Yes. Regent Dunkel? Did you hear me say yes? Uh, no. I heard okay. just now. <laughs> Sorry. Regent, Re Regent Dunkel votes yes. Regent Butker? Yes. Regent Lindemeyer? Yes. Regent Richards votes yes. The motion is approved. Is there any other business to come before this board? Hearing none. The meeting of the Board of Regents State of Iowa is adjourned. I don't have my hammer anymore, so thank you, everybody. Thanks.